what was the first historical reference to astrology? <laughs> it was the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it was almost identical to the Western astrology we have today. So who started this? Because it does seem like remarkably accurate on so many levels, right? Numerology can be like crazy accurate. And so when you start digging into it, you're like, who established all this stuff? Uh, the 52 card playing deck even, right? Where did all this stuff come from? You're gonna find that literally all of it, this esoteric wisdom that seems to have withstood the passage of time, all came through Hermes Trace Majestus. Robert Grant is the polymath Renaissance man who has been decoding some of the ancient secrets that have been hidden and encrypted in so much of our art, so much of our text. And what I really wanted to do for this podcast was bring him on to discuss hermetic wisdom. I recently devoured this book called The Kabbalion, which is teaching hermetic wisdom that comes, if you believe the myth, all the way back from the time of Abraham and has filtered through Egyptian and Roman and Greek culture, gone underground and then resurfaced. And there's incredible value in these codes, these seven codes of hermetic wisdom and all of the different laws and understandings in between. So in this podcast, we just dive right in and it's one of the most interesting fields of philosophy, spirituality that I've ever encountered. And I'm really excited to share the principles of hermetic wisdom with Robert Grant on this podcast. So enjoy this show with Robert Grant. The truth is, is that we're all the master. We're all the healer. We're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. Robert, you're back. Good to see you. And I called you back for a very specific reason because after we finished our last meeting, I read this book called The Kybalion, and it was first published, I think, in 1906, and it was the resurfacing of some what they claim to be mystery school wisdom from Hermes Trismegistus that resurfaced in 1906 and then resurfaced again in a reprinting, and someone recommended it to me. It was actually my brother, Makad, and I was like, oh, shit. Like a lot of this I'd heard and I'd found myself quoting Hermes Trismegistus, but didn't really know the source material from where it came from. And this is something that you know a lot about. So I was like, man, we got to get back here and we got to talk about it. And where I want to start is who, who was Hermes? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think he's probably had many characters through what we would consider our history. Um, through different incarnations. And, you know, a lot of people talk about Enoch, right, being related to Hermes. Uh, a lot Who's of people. Enoch? Okay, so we're going deep now. Let's go, yeah, why okay, not? Okay, so it. there's a non-canonical uh, books of the Bible, right? And one of them is, is called the Book of Enoch. So Enoch tells a story of an antediluvian or pre-diluvian, pre-flood mm -hmm. period of time. So like in the period- And where, where, was the, where are these books found? Like where, where are these non-biblical books found? You know, so in 325 uh, AD- Council there was of Nicaea. A, Council of Nicaea, exactly. So Constantine, who was also the emperor of Rome at the time, decided to declare himself the Pope. And now if you can't beat him, the Christian and you know the Christians at the time. Let's join them. Mm -hmm. So let's let's set the rules for it. We're going to bring together all the bishops and everything. And and they looked at it as this is a big spiritual awakening. But we need to make you know the official sort of statement on these are the books of the Bible. Until that time, there were many many other books. Mm -hmm. A lot of books didn't make it into this canonization. Yeah, but so, where did they go? They're still around. They're still okay. around. The Gospel of Thomas is another good example of this. Some of them are called the Apocrypha. If you've ever heard of the Apocrypha. Uh -huh. So these are like esoteric wisdom teachings that often the Essenes or the Gnostics also held and kept and 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 for you know literally thousands of years. So basically, you know, what you find even in Qumran when they had the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? References were made inside of those and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls to some of these non-canonized books of the of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the Council of Nicaea, you have to think about an imperial structure that 
saw that the slave classes loved this new mm-hmm. teaching, both for its virtue, of course, there's so much virtue in the truth of Christianity mm-hmm. and, the, and the teachings of Yeshua when you can actually look through some of the ways in which the, quote, church has twisted those teachings. But if you looked at the deep core of it, such powerful wisdom, number one. Number two, it started to flip and reverse the power structure because there was just a few wealthy aristocrats and there was tons and tons of poor peasants, proletariat, whatever you wanted to call them. And this religion started to flourish amongst them. Blessed are the meek. You know, it just kind of flipped everything on its head and it was all about the virtue of your inner world, of your heart, of your compassion, of your kindness, of your love, of your service, not the strength of your arm and your armor and your conquering. And so it flipped this whole Roman paradigm Mm -hmm. on its head. So you got an emperor there who's organizing a council and being like, we got to take all these texts and we got to make them work for us. And that alone should give people a little bit of a question about yeah, what's in totally, the Bible. That's right. This right? doesn't agree with my policy, so this is not. It would going be in the like Bible. if the current government right. was like all these spiritual teachings. We gotta take what we want, and we gotta eliminate the rest, mm-hmm. and say that we're spiritual. Right? Like, why would you trust them? Exactly. To make the fucking make the cuts. They're not the right editor. They got a vested interest. They're not unbiased in fact, source. Arguably the opposite, right? Yeah. The, the one that you should be most skeptical of. Well, the book of Enoch is one of those such books. And you can find tons and tons of references to this all across the internet. You can, I mean, just type in book of Enoch. You'll find a bunch of stuff, both from, you know, even rabbinical kind of uh, students and even rabbis themselves who will talk about this, but also in in Kabbalah, but also across Christianity and everything. So this is kind of well known. And the book of Enoch tells a story about Enoch. Now, Enoch was a man who became godlike, okay? And he built a city, and the city, the city of Enoch became so holy that it transcended this dimension, as it's described in this book. Mm. And so it was, the, it was the kingdom. It was like a kingdom, right? It would be kind of or comparable. Or the kingdom, like the way Maybe that, like a Shambhala. Yeah. Right? Maybe like a Shambhala, like a spiritual domain. And so he sort of transcended these things. Now, a lot of people, myself included, believe that, that uh, Enoch came back in several incarnations, right? And, and this was Hermes Trace Magistus, also, uh, also referred to in the Egyptian pantheon as Thoth, right? Also pronounced Thoth just like a thought inside your head. Mm -hmm. Uh, In addition, you have other references where it might be that Melchizedek was also one of these incarnations. So Mm -hmm. you've heard of the keys of Melchizedek. That's who Paul Selig, who's been on my podcast many times, if he's forced and pressed to give a name to the guides that he's talking to, it's Melchizedek. Yeah, and and Melchizedek means Melchizedek, right? It's a Hebrew word. You probably know that Jerusalem, right, is like peace, right, Salem. Mm -hmm. Right, shalom. so it's like shalom, shalom. Right, it's like peace be with you, kind of a concept. The way we say shalom, mm-hmm. and Jerusalem, and when you talk about Abraham, Abraham paid tithes to the the, the chief priest at the time, and he went to visit him, which was lived in Salem, and his name was Malkitzedek, and Malki means king, right? Mm-hmm. Like Melek, or even the name Malik in Indian, right, in Hindu means king also. So it is like ancient mm. stuff through etymology that's gone all over the place. Tzedek also can mean like justice or peace. So The king of peace. Yeah, like the king of peace and justice in a way, mm-hmm. say it like that. So basically you have this personage who has reincarnated through time and always brought with that incarnation lots of wisdom. So now when, when we say incarnation, some people can have a very literal linear way that you, that you look at this, right? But fundamentally, we all, uh, not we all, but you can have your own unique body and your own unique configuration. Of course you do. You have different mm-hmm. flesh and different things. You could even be a different potentially iteration of something, but actually tap into the current and the frequency because in those non-physical dimensions, as I understand them through all of my journeys and through all of my studies, things are recorded in vibrations. And these vibrations, you have 
the ability to access. So like Paul Selig can access the vibration of Melchizedek and allow yeah. that mm -hmm. vibration Channeling. to channel mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's a lot of ways that when we say incarnation, it doesn't mean like I was fucking Marcus Aurelius in a past life or Although something. you would have made a very good Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Robert. I could see That's you very, in that breastplate. It's an breast unnecessary compliment, yeah. but I will accept. <laughs> I will fucking accept. But nonetheless, like, so, so when you think about this, just think about somebody who's tapping into, at the very least, the energy of mm -hmm. what the vibrational signature and collected intelligence of this being yeah. that we call Hermes mm -hmm. might be. And that could very well be the case too. But there are certain signatures, and throughout Scripture, we see references to people getting keys, right? We've all heard about the keys of Peter, the keys of Melchizedek, right? The keys of Enoch. There's a book called The Keys of Enoch as well by J.J. Hurtak that's worth reading if you're interested to learn more about this. And I remember when we first met via text, I think I asked you if you were into Hermeticism mm -hmm. the very first time as well, and, and you hadn't yet read Kybalion. And then when we talked at the last time, you're like, I just read Kybalion. It was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. That was like, wow. And I, I feel like there is this frequency, maybe it's a frequency connection, it might be an incarnation connection, that ties several of these people throughout history together, right? Where we see these kind of keys, keys of Solomon, Mm -hmm. another man of great wisdom who I know you've studied a lot about Absolutely. as well. So, and they all have sigils as well, which is kind of interesting. So there's kind of a different meaning. I think I'm wearing David's sigil on my... Yeah, you've got a Star of David, which my, uh, also originates necklace. with, uh, as well, with the, that turned into Seal of Solomon mm -hmm. as well. So I think there's some depth to this. And this concept of, even as recently as someone like St. Germain, Right, you may have heard of Saint Germain. The Saint violet, Germain, the violet purple flame. Exactly. Of Saint so Germain. Saint Germain was this very interesting character from like the 18th century that everyone thought lived for possibly hundreds of years. Even he was very charismatic. He could hold a conversation, but he never ate at dinner. Uh, he was always maybe that's why he looked so old. And he was <laughs> well, well, he never aged though. That's the thing. He, yeah. he he didn't age, and that's what people claim about him. And he was, you know, you'll find him throughout history, like involved in things like the American Revolution. He's like showing up in different places. It's like, how could he have been at all these different places? It's like the movie Highlander. Exactly. It's like the movie <laughs> Highlander. And, and this guy's really interesting because he speaks many languages, right? He's extremely charismatic. Um, and people thought he must be a charlatan because he couldn't possibly have done all the things that he seems to have known and done in his lifetime. Yeah because he had to live many lifetimes. So there's all kinds of huge lore around this guy. A lot of people believe that, again, tapping into that same frequency or possibly incarnation mm -hmm. of Thoth, of Hermes. Also, that, that traces potentially all the way to St. Germain is what you're saying. It could yes. be, so it could go Enoch, it could go you know, Thoth, it could go Melchizedek. Hermes, mm -hmm. Melchizedek, Solomon. Hermes, mm -hmm. all of these different characters in a different iteration, articulation, and, and one of the teachings of Solomon and the teachings of like the deep mystical Kabbalah and Torah mm -hmm. is that we all have the potential to actually merge our own will and consciousness with divine will. But it's not that we become effaced. It's not that we lose everything that makes us unique. We actually subsume, like the divine moves through us we as integrated. us, integrated mm -hmm. as us. And so what we see through our lens and our perspective and our portal actually supersedes any text that had gone before because it's the right information for this time in this context. As we all know, if you give advice out of context, it could be pretty fucking useless. Sometimes it's universal. Sometimes it's of the wrong time. And so this idea that you can always rewrite the Torah, rewrite the scripture, if you're able to step into your own highest divine consciousness as you, not just the divine somewhere neutral, but the divine as you, then you actually can deliver a message, which is why all of these messages, even if it is the same being or the same frequency, could seem quite different because it was specifically filtered through the lens of that person at that time in that specific way. But the information, of course, is going to be different because it's going to be serving and meeting the need of exactly the people and the place that he was yeah, occupying. I fully agree. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of the sixth hermetic principle, which is you know, cause and effect. That every cause has an effect and every effect has a cause. 
it's all everything sort of has connected. its cause and its effect. Chance exactly. is but a name for law not recognized. Exactly. And and that's how I feel about randomness. I don't believe in randomness. <laughs> right? Randomness is just our inability to perceive God's patterned encryption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't care what the number sequence is. I've always been able to find patterns in it if I really deeply look. But, you know, we talked about this last time. What is randomness? It's just a boundary condition where our knowledge ends and our ignorance begins. And as we expand human consciousness, we push the boundary out further and further. And that expands probably at something like the speed of light. Interesting that the universe is expanding about that same speed too. Maybe it's just our consciousness. Oh, and that goes to the first principle of hermeticism. Mentalism. The principle of mentalism. The all is mind, the universe is mental. I read this and I was like, no shit. And because I, I came to that conclusion after trying three times to write a book called Master Your Mind. 60,000 words. 60,000 words thrice. <laughs> all still- thrice. All thrice majestic. <laughs> <laughs> all stillborn mm -hmm. because finally it had to bring me to the conclusion, hey, dummy, you can't separate the mind from anything else. So how are you going to master the mind? Like that's saying, I might as well write a book, Master the Universe, and put a picture of fucking He-Man on the cover and make it a comic because I had no chance. And that's, I kept running into that problem. I just I want to know to who separate Skeletor is. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think if we put that question out in the polls, we'd get a lot of similar answers probably. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I realized that and I was like, you have to define, whether you call it mind or whether you call it something else, you could call it love if you like, but I think mind is a good way for us to think yeah. about it. Mm -hmm you have to define it all as the same substrate to actually understand it. So call it mind or call it something, but it is actually all the same substrate, really, of just different densities. Now, there's a great quote by Max Planck, who was pretty much the mentor that made Einstein famous because Einstein working in a, as a patent clerk needed somebody to sponsor him, right? Mm. Who was gonna be well-regarded in the academic community and that was Max Planck. Max Planck is famous for many things, particularly in quantum physics. Now, he and Einstein didn't agree on everything. You know, he was more of the mindset that the universe is based on mind. He said, there is no matter as such. We must conclude that at the base of everything is really just a conscious mind. Mm. And when you think about it in those terms, you start to then realize, and that's why I've kind of come to the conclusion that we have a you and you have a you inverse mm -hmm. around you, right? So it's an, all of it is a mental construct. We cannot separate. There is no such thing as true objective reality in the context that we all see the world through our own prism. Yeah. So that is our, what we believe to be objective. We all think that our perception of a thing is objective, but as we start to expand our awareness, we realize there's different ways of looking at the same things or circumstances. That's why we have a crime and there are 30 eyewitnesses that have entirely different accounts mm -hmm. of the exact same occurrence. So this is something that I was you know, definitely hoping that we would get into because the idea of the you know, perspectival nature of all of our perception is pretty much unquestionable. Nobody watches the same movie because you're watching it through your own lens and through your own eyes and your own associations and everything that's coming there. Nobody reads the same book. Nobody knows the same person. We're all living in our own multiverse within the universe, mm -hmm. the one verse, which is our own, pers our own perspective. However, that doesn't mean that everything is just a story and nothing is real necessarily. And I think that's the way that postmodernity has taken it, that everything's just a story, nothing's real, nothing matters. And one of the things that I've been really studying with Rabbi Gaffney is actually the correlation between, in the Kabbalist lineage, the goddess Shekinah and the Tao. And it's basically a set of first principles and first values like the law. So if you read the Tao Te Ching, it says the Tao is older than God. I don't know who created it. I don't know what created it, but the Tao is older than God. And that is like, it's like the law that's underneath perspective itself. And it's even, and that's why they're saying it's even, it's even, you know, earlier than God. It was even older than God. Right? And see, that's where I would place 
the seven hermetic principles. And that's that's where this seems to be reaching it's for. Like it's the like the laws of the construct. This is so basically the hermetic principles are getting to the Tao or in another and another, so maybe, you know, Lao Tzu was another iteration mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. this Hermes Trismegistus thought in just maybe. another way, mm -hmm. in another mystic. Maybe Rumi was as well, mm -hmm. who said, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the ocean in a drop. Obviously, that's the principle of correspondence, yep. like spoken extremely poetically. But either way, people are accessing this particular type of wisdom, and it seems to be reaching for that thing, the first principles and first values of the entire everything, the all that ever is, and then all of the creations are built upon that stack. Well, and I believe fundamentally that part of the struggle that we face right now as a, as a people, as humanity, is we are still very much clinging to this anachronistic, I believe, notion of materialism. Mm -hmm. And this leads to reductionism. It, really, it leads to more more and more confirmation bias of that reductionism and materialism it's all stacked on itself so this is one of the biggest challenges relative to our educational system right now that's becoming kind of an anachronism in our world today well it's not our it's not only our education system it's our medical system it's yeah, our financial totally. system it's our every system it's trying to reduce it to the smallest part that you can understand even even using words to describe a thing is incredibly reductionist if i say hey robert i'm reducing you to a symbol that can be placed in a name and it yes it means something bigger but we sometimes forget that the word is just a placeholder that clumsily approximates something that would be impossible to actually describe yeah. and this is one of the things one of the reasons i reject the notion of being titled Right. In one area. Because as soon as you say, oh, someone will ask, you know, and the way over here in the Uber, the Uber driver asked me, he goes, so what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm doing a podcast with Arby Marcus. And then he goes, uh, oh, okay, are you going to need a ride back later this afternoon or whatever? And I said, I said, probably I got another podcast with Danica, Danica Patrick. And, and he's like, what do you do? And he goes, what do you, what's your expertise? And I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm all, all of a sudden feeling this like gravitational pull towards mm. just to come up with a convenient answer. Give him a give him a, a something he can hang on to yeah. so he can quickly understand and then dismiss. Which reason. is more narrow, right? More narrow than what I actually am. Do you think we cling do you think we crave that because there's a discomfort when we don't understand something and there's dissonance? Like the, so the discomfort comes why? What is he doing that allows him to get this? There's think, a little bit of discomfort and then if they get yeah. if they get something that they can just slide in and the discomfort yeah. stops and they're like, ah, everything yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because we all feel comfortable when we can categorize something. Yeah, totally. Right? It's like, okay, he's a policeman. I know how policemen think, and I'll, but he's not going to talk to me about anything outside of police stuff that I'm going to listen to. Yeah. I can then sort of shut it down. And we all do this. When we see a circumstance or event, it doesn't matter what it is, we want to categorize it that fast. Yeah. And by categorizing it too quickly, we keep ourselves stuck in this world of judgment rather than just pure observation. And we can learn a lot more by looking at things, taking a moment and saying, without being so quick to judge it, saying, okay, let me see what the other ways to look at this are. Because maybe the only true objective truth would be a mathematical equ equation. It's a mathematical equation, which is the sum of all perspectives. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do now is I try to look at things through other lenses that would be juxtaposed to my own, even if I don't feel like I could agree with it right away. I want to try to do that so that I can step into another person's consciousness, another person's shoes. And in a way, I think that in and of itself, if we can strive for looking at things that way, then that helps us to find forgiveness. It helps us to find empathy. It helps us you know, to look at the world probably the way that maybe God would look at the world. And if that all sounds too highbrow for you and you're like, ah, not interested, it'll make you a better lover. Mm -hmm. It'll make you a better leader. Better it'll listener. make you a better friend. Mm -hmm. You know, like, are these things you care about, being a lover, a leader, and a friend? Well, then these principles are important. The ability to step inside the inside of somebody else's experience and not keep your safe distance. And it's really vulnerable when you do that because you're subject to feel what they feel and experience what they experience. 100%. And so it's obviously you need to choose those people you do with. 
you do it with, you know, wisely or do it from afar. You know, you obviously don't want to go step into anybody who's sniffing spray paint on the you know street corner or whatever. Like yeah. it might be. A I don't rock. need to step into every <laughs> shoe, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you want to you want to be able to imagine it, just not actually right, step exactly. into it. But nonetheless, it's still important to like step in there so you don't have that judgment when he's talking to her, she's talking to himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's such a valuable skill. And then it's an even more important skill when you actually have somebody that you love and you trust and is in your in your inner circle, your tribe, and then you can step into each other's experience. And that is what solves the great problem of loneliness because you'll see yourself as a mirror in that person that you're stepping inside. And that's the you inverse. Yeah. That's the you inverse. So when you realize that the universe is mental and there's a reason why the first of the hermetic principles is mentalism, it's so core to understanding all the rest. Each stacks on each other. And when you realize that, then you start realizing that every experience that you have is not just happening to you, it's actually happening for you. Whether you're conscious of it or not is up to you. You may not be aware of it until later on. And we just think that the world's happening to us. Oh my gosh, something bad happened. Oh, life is difficult. Woe is me. I'm a victim, blah, blah, blah. Well, or you yeah. can look at it differently and say, what is my you inverse or my subconscious mind, the lens through which I'm seeing the world, trying to teach me, my higher self, trying to project back to me so that I will come to that realization? You know, you could go to school for years and years and years and study the didactics, but until you experience it in some sort of a role play that you believe is actually real, you haven't really fully learned it. Mm. And so often people will say, well, what does all this stuff mean? You know, how does this help or save the whales? Or how does this save deforestation or whatever? Well, if you actually study further into this, you'll realize that what we judge will just continue to be projected back to us. So in a way, when you start to really go down this rabbit hole of, okay, I'm going to be an advocate for this, that, or the other thing, by your own judgments of those things. Especially advocate against. Yeah, exactly. You will only perpetuate those things. It's the hammer and nail situation. Mm -hmm. And that comes out of all of this you know, understanding of the hermetic principles. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so powerful for me. But one thing I want to mention also, when you ask who is Thoth and who is, who is Hermes, Hermes, you can learn a lot about him also. So there's several books. I, you know, Kybalion is one. Mm -hmm. It's excellent by the three initiates. I love it. And you can listen to it on YouTube. It's, it's fantastic. Around the same time, there was a translation that came out of the Emerald Tablets. So we're talking about the early 20th century. And in the early 20th century, there was kind of a, a bit of a mini renaissance that was happening. You saw a lot of advances in physics that was happening at that time. Right. You saw people like Walter Russell. They, they started creating societies of like polymathic thought, like the Twilight Club in New York City that Walter Russell was a founder of. And I'm excited because I'm going to probably go and speak at uh, his university in Virginia here in the next few weeks or so. But basically, this, there was this small little mini kind of, I'd say, right after, right around the turn of the century up until probably around, you know, the crash in 1929, there was this really interesting time happening. It was kind of the roaring 20s, and, and there was a very different philosophy and thought. Art was also exploding at that time. And, and what you find during that period of time is that people were going through these sort of expansions. So you, you hear about also, you know, leading up into that late uh, 19th century, like Helena Blavatska, right, Bovatsky, excuse me, and, and Rudolf Steiner and other people that were kind of luminaries during this period of the world. And there was this expansion going on. So one of those things that came out of this was not only the, the work by the three initiates and the Kybalion, but also the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. Now, Emerald Tablets have been around for a long time, but there were different translations of it. This was a channel translation that was done by uh, a guy by the name of Doriel. So I would definitely look into that because it tells mm -hmm. a story also of Thoth, the Atlantean. So it goes all the way back in time and tells a story. And he actually claims in this writing that he built the pyramid. He was the designer of it. Now, it's funny because in Egyptian history, you, they tell the story of a guy by the name of uh, Hemiunu. Hemiunu would have been the architect for the Great Pyramid. But Hemiunu sounds a lot like Hermiunu. 
right? Mm-hmm. It could definitely be some sort of connection between the two. And, and when you get into that, you can learn the whole story about how Atlantis fell and then how civilization was, was maintained, how they moved to Chem, the land of Chem, Egypt. Which is where, if people have listened to my podcast, Matthias De Stefano mm-hmm. remembers uh, life he lived as a woman mm-hmm. with a child and sings the songs, and mm-hmm. it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And he tells stories of Thoth as a being, yeah, as a being in the flesh, mm-hmm. not just a, a deity a, that's a aggregation of energy that people are worshiping, but no, it was a being. Yeah, and he was sort of like you could think of him as the king of the land, also for thousands of years, in fact. And so, you know, depending on which historical timeline you kind of like prescribe to, one of them is the pyramids are something on the order more of about 13,000 years old, some are even older still, um, you know, that it was before the Yunga Dryas, that, and we had like some major calamity that happened, you know, around after that time. Also, the flood kind of plays into this. But basically, that story is worth reading. Mm-hmm. It's worth going through. There's something about it where... We all kind of have this ability to know if something is worth listening to or reading. And as the words permeate into your consciousness, there's something very powerful about that particular book. It's fascinating. And it's written in a very prose kind of way. So it's beautifully written. It feels like like scripture mm-hmm. in a way. It's got this kind of kind of holy feeling to it. And I probably read it and listened to it at least 200 times. Wow. And every time I listen to it or read it, I get something entirely new from it. It's, um, there's something very powerful about it. Yeah. Same thing with Kybalion. Kybalion is yeah. another good example. Her, the Hermeticum is also another one that is worth reading. It's a short book, and it's a reiteration of a lot of these principles that have been passed down generation after generation, sometimes through sort of hidden secret society type stuff. It's hidden so that it can be found. So if we do our job, you'll both not need to read these books and be even more excited to read these books. Yes, that's right. So that's Mm -hmm. what we're here to do. So this podcast and pretty much everything I do is made possible by Onnit. And the great thing about Onnit is it's a company where I created all of the best products that would support me in a holistic life, physically, mentally, through all of the human optimization technologies that Onnit offers and is available And this ranges from kettlebells to the steel clubs, the steel maces to the alpha brain, which I use before every podcast and the shroom tech, which I use before every workout and the total NO that I use when I want to flex in the gym and have a really good workout. Really everything that I've ever wanted from a human optimization standpoint is offered through Onnit. So I encourage you guys to check it out. Go to onnit.com slash Aubrey and you'll save 10% off absolutely everything and thank you for your support of On It, which is directly support to me. Thanks, fam. So let me go through a couple of these different notes that I had. The first note, this is a quote from the Kabbalion. The principles of truth are seven. He who knows these understandingly possesses the magic key before whose touch all the doors of the temple fly open. The key. So these are like, and these are these. That's exactly what these have been. These have been keys for me to start unlocking these different rooms in my psyche. Like if I can use this key correctly, and we'll talk about some of the ways that I've used these keys already. Mm -hmm. But I'm just, I know I'm just now getting on the journey. But Mm -hmm. when you were talking about the principle of mentalism, this one key, the all is mine, the universe is mental. What you were previously saying about how things that you're projecting out into the world are reflected back to you. Well, if you think of it as all one mind, then of course that's going to Mm -hmm. be the way that it's going for. And of course, also the other thing that you can look at with this key is if it is all one mind, everything is happening in right reason and right accord, right? Like whatever, whatever is Whatever is going on, we may not be able to understand it from our perspective, but from the largest mental perspective, it may make perfect sense. And Matthias talks about this a lot. For part of the necessity of creation, of course, is polarity. We'll talk about the principle of polarity. But part of polarity requires distortion, and distortion is a force that prevents us from seeing everything as same. 
Mm-hmm. You know, seeing everything as all as one. Distortion comes in and says, oh, I am separate. And yeah. and, it, and it's also been called Maya, the illusion. There's mm-hmm. a lot of ways that you can look at this, but some way in which we're not seeing the absolute truth, because if we saw the absolute truth, it'd be one note, one color, one sound, one, you know, the, it, we would see beyond all of the differentiation. We wouldn't get to experience our own differentiation. Exactly, exactly. So within that, you start to understand, huh? Maybe this is all just a part of the symphony. And right now we could be in a part of the song that's like the deep, low, strident, you know, viola part that's mm-hmm. kind of building the mm-hmm. intensity and anxiety. Mm-hmm. That's okay. It's all part of a big, grander symphony. And co-creatively, we are the conductors deciding how this orchestra goes. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, I remember I was invited to go. I, I met Deepak Chopra in 20, I think it was 2014. And he came to my office, and and I wrote up on the board, on the whiteboard, uh, the symbol, the ohm symbol. And I said, you know what this actually also means? And he's like, what? I go, it's it's three, six, nine. And the nine is backwards, because it's the way the Sanskrit so it basically would write. And and then you've got like this, looks like an I at the top with a dot in the center, and that's one of the ways to write the number six. So three, six, nine. And, and, and he said... Wow, he was like kind of blown away by that. And I said, I said, uh, Nikola Tesla talks about this. And he goes, how would Tesla know about this? And I said, well, because his, his guru was Swami Vivekananda, who's a famous Swami, you know, it was kind of like a Yogananda level uh, guy in the late um, 19th century, early 20th century that came to the United States and, and taught and Tesla was, you know, a devout. Of, of that person. He was definitely someone who followed him very closely. And so he invited me. He said, you need to come with me. He took me in, you know, we're in a big meeting with there are a lot of pe- people around. He goes, took me in this other room. He goes, you need to come with me to Kerala. You need to come with me to Kerala. It's in Southern India. And there's a, a big temple there, and like a very old temple with these two snakes on the doors. It's like super famous. There's supposed to be a Vimana in the base of it and everything. I was like, okay, this sounds really cool. So he invites me to go. And the last second, I unfortunately couldn't go because I had a board meeting got called. Mm -hmm. And I was going through a major crisis at the time. It was a difficult situation. So I called him up and I said, I I fortunately can't make it. And he said, don't worry, Robert. Everything is as it should be. And I didn't really know what that meant because in that moment in time, I was still thinking that, no, 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 we make the world happen. Right, whatever it is that we do, we can kind of like either let it happen to us or we make it happen. I didn't realize at that time that I now believe very strongly that everything is connected. And both are true. And this is this is the hard part is that we have to be able to embrace paradox exactly to understand any aspect of the universe. Yeah, you got to make it happen. <laughs> and the universe is making you happen and you're making it happen and the universe is making you happen and and everything else around you happen because it's all mind. <laughs> right, right. And that's how it can work. When you think about it, I'll give you another example. It's pretty funny. I was uh, on Instagram and I see this post from this gentleman page or whatever that I follow. And and this guy had like a neck brace on. And this pretty girl walks down the street right by him. And he like jerks his neck to look at her. He's like, oh, that hurt, right? Like this. And then mm. another one walks by this way. He does it again. He's like, oh, it hurts. And it says that men will be men. Type of thing. <laughs> and I was just laughing about this. And not 30 minutes later, I get on a conference call with my attorneys to work on some licensing agreement on patents. And our attorney gets on and he's got a big ass neck brace on. <laughs> right. And I was like thinking, hmm, I've never had a call with lawyers where there was a guy with a neck brace. And I just saw this like 10 minutes ago. Is this another form of mentalism? Right, where the things that we are seeing and l- registering consciously are starting to become manifested in the world around us very rapidly through synchronicities. Mm-hmm. And you, it's another pattern of connection. And, and of course, obviously, you're not saying that you looking at that post caused the guy's neck to break, right? No, but- But, but what you're saying is that there's a correlation at a plane of causation that's far higher and far beyond yes. what we even understand. And it puts something in motion, which created a spray paint effect of this kind uh-huh. of splatter gun of like, okay, now neck brace is going to enter this this aspect of consciousness, right? And it's, again, this would be, this would go back to this, 
principle of cause and effect, chance is but a name for law not recognized. Yeah. So what you're suggesting is part of that principle of cause and effect that, all right, yeah, that's chance. Right now, as far as we know, that's chance, but there may be a law that we're not recognizing at a plane that we don't have access to. There's, I don't believe in coincidences. I, I used to. I now, when I was very much a materialistic thinker, I believed in coincidences. Now I don't believe in coincidences at all, at all, because I've had way too many examples where I had thought previously something was coincidence and I realized later that it was all part of a macro pattern that was just too large for me to see from my zoomed in too close to the tree to see the forest perspective. As soon as you zoom out and start looking at things from a larger standpoint, then those patterns start to become more visible mm -hmm. to the naked eye. And you start realizing I'm learning something through this. And it's a beautiful process. Just now that you've read Kybalion, I'm sure that uh, if you haven't yet, you will soon start experiencing more synchronicities. And this is one of the things that Carl Jung talks about. The, the surest sign of the path to enlightenment or what he called the individuation process is the number of synchronicities you start to register and experience in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I just had one right before you came. So we had a, you know, an old Onnit employee that I knew, but I knew him in the Onnit context. And he really got this urge to connect to me and really show me like what he was all about. Mm -hmm. And he loves playing different tabletop games like Pokemon, Digimon. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know that I was an old school Magic the Gathering player and like went deep really? into that world. <laughs> so I shared that with him. He's like, oh man. And he got real excited. And he's like, I gotta, I'm gonna make some things for you. He made this awesome gift box that was hilarious and has watercolors and it. it had one very special Magic the Gathering pack it was a pack that was in an entire giant box so you know that the pack was like full of all ultra rare rare cards right well wow. it's cool what a fucking gift i haven't opened up a booster pack in a fucking long time <laughs> yeah. too so i open it up and the premium card in the whole deck so there's the rares and then there's the super rares is a card that's the something i forget his name but it's the astral dragon now if you know, I just released a documentary called Dragon of the Jungle, which is literally about an astral dragon, which <laughs> which has been since that, you know, and that released a week ago. Mm -hmm. And it's also been a way that I've been experiencing, you know, consciousness through the realm, through the lens of this mythical creature of being of power and trying to connect to the astral dragon so kind here's of energy. Another synchronicity. And exactly that's what I'm saying. Like what are, I mean, a dragon, sure, it's Magic the Gathering. There's dragons all the there's dragons all over the place. An astral dragon as the rare card in the one pack that I got. Coincidence. Or this is this is like just a wink from the divine being like, there you go, boy. Like make sure you're paying attention. So I'll give you another wink. Tied to the astral dragon. So on April 23rd and 24th, I spent the night in the Great Pyramid. This a couple months ago, three months ago. And it was the holiest night of the year. It was Ramadan. The pyramids were closed during the day. I was supposed to be there with uh, with a CEO of a major network, kind of a television network thing, and he couldn't make it last second. So I said, well, I'll just go to the pyramid by myself. So I went in, and I spent like four hours in the pyramid by myself. And while I was in there, I looked at the wall. And I'd already found, you know, my wife Susie actually found the bull and the cow that was on the, on the wall that matched the one on the Last Supper painting on the right side. But above the bull and the cow, I'd always seen this writing. There was always writing, and I, I kept seeing writing up there, and it was kind of like this swooshy kind of a shape, like a sine, cosine wave. This time I went in there, I noticed I could see the pattern. And it's a dragon. Hmm. In fact, it wasn't one dragon, it's three. <laughs> three dragons, and they're attached to a tree. Now, you may have seen when the queen had her diamond jubilee thing recently. Um, what queen? I didn't queen see. Queen of it. England. Queen uh -huh. of England. She lit up this. It was very bizarre. It's like there's this globe on this, like the royal pillow and the globe. And so she goes and pushes on the globe. And all of a sudden, these lights go in the shape of three-strand DNA. And then they connect to like a tree of life and light up the tree of life. And I was like, that was a month after I found that on the wall inside the King's Chamber. I haven't even released this or the photographs of it anywhere yet. But this dragon has been all about Kundalini mm -hmm. and the third dragon, which is the Sheen, right? It's, it's what happens through the staff of Hermes, right? 
they're, they're, you get into one mind. And it's no longer yin yang. It's now yin shen yang. Yeah, it's the line in between the yin and the yang. Right. So you talk about shekinah, mm-hmm. right? It's relative to that. Yeah. And so this whole thing, and you mentioned the dragon when I was at your conference, I bought a ring. Mm hmm. Because, uh, you know, they had vendors there. It was like, I felt like I was at Woodstock or something. You know? <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty off. <laughs> it was Arcadia, pretty epic, yeah. Right? Robert spoke at Arcadia. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 I saw this ring there. And, and so I put on this ring and it was like made of copper. Uh-huh. And so I was like, okay, I like the look of copper. Cool. And it's a dragon, right? And, and so this dragon energy, the astral dragon energy has been very much of very high meaning to me for the last two, three months. So the fact that you just released your thing on this, right? That's how I would look at this now is I would say, okay, you telling me that story is another synchronicity, Mm -hmm. right? So it builds on even the synchronicity you have, and then it might serve for you to be a synchronicity. When we realize that it's all mind, we're all one. Yeah. And, and we're all collectively connected through this consciousness. Mm Mm-hmm. And then once you get past that notion, because it, it takes a lot to break away from materialism, to get into mentalism. But once you do, then you can go into correspondence. Mm. And that's the second, yeah. right? This, yeah. this is the second principle of, you know, kind of the her- seven hermetic principles. And correspondence is embodied in the statement, as above, so below. What does that mean? I think the first place that I started to recognize that was before I even really knew much about any of this, I started to study fractal geometry. And what does fractal geometry even mean? So if you were to zoom in on a EKG of your heart wave, right? So you've got a QRS complex and a T wave, QRS complex and a T wave. It's kind of interesting because if you zoom in further into the parts that look totally flatline, so you've got this wave that goes like this up and down, then you got a T wave, and then it goes up again. This is called the QRS complex, and then it goes like this. We've all seen what an EKG thing looks mm-hmm. like. But if you zoom in on the dead space in between, keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, you'll see the same wave again mm. as a fractal form, a smaller form of it. And I suppose one of the limitations is, uh, maybe they don't do this anymore, but you used to see those on with ink. You know, they would have a little machine that would be mm-hmm. writing it out. But now that it's digital, it just depends on how sensitive the equipment is to actually be able to register. It could probably go all the way up and all the way down, <laughs> registering all the ways. So if you even zoomed in like the Mandelbrot, you know, the Mandelbrot set, that's like exactly what fractal set. geometry is. And mm-hmm. so even if you looked into the EKG, it would be little patterns upon patterns upon patterns. And you could just keep zooming in. Obviously, we don't have instruments that are sensitive enough to detect that. They're starting to build it. But they, but they mm-hmm. will. And ultimately, mm-hmm. I think that's when we'll start to show this principle of correspondence in a lot easier way. And also, we now we have James Webb Telescope looking out farther and farther. And I don't totally. know how useful it is right now at this stage, but it's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it's very cool. And you can see the cool nebula and stuff. I mean, it's like super clear photographs and everything that we've never been able to see before. You know, it's not a coincidence now that, that we're now able to observe what it looks like to see a black hole, right, as of a couple of years ago. And when that photograph got released on the internet of that, I can't remember her name, the, the woman who basically was doing the research and caught a photograph of a black hole. You know, this is, we're finding, again, we're pushing that boundary of ignorance farther and farther out, right? We still don't understand what is dark matter, what is dark energy. And as we start to understand this dark matter, dark energy, maybe this is really just an analog for the own aspects of our own subconscious mind, we are yet to become consciously aware of. Thinking out loud, I haven't really thought about this till now, but is it possible that dark energy and dark matter, and again, my you know astrophysics and quantum physics is very amateur, but could it be possible that that is actually a window into the Tao, the all, the Shekinah, and like that's actually we're looking at the void and the void has a form because the form is the first values and first principles of the Tao, of the Shekinah, of the Hermetic principles. And we're actually seeing some kind of representation come through the blackness. So it's not nothing. And that's what we're saying. It's not oh, it's nothing. It's definitely not nothing. It's not nothing. It seems like nothing. But if you actually really look, the, there would be an encoding in the nothing. And the encoding is that thing that was you know, older than God. Yeah, and maybe it's all about our own mindset. And there's probably some physicists like, dummy, 
That's a terrible idea. No. But maybe I, not. <laughs> no, I think it's 100% correct. I, I actually, I mean, look, you got physicists. <laughs> in 2012, they discover the, the Higgs boson, right? And they co-name that the God particle. I think there's, amongst large circles within some of the physics community, as you continue to go further and further into this, I mean, we could go down this reductionistic path and just realize that Every time we look for something, whatever we're looking for, we will find. Yeah. Right. So the observer effect. Let's find it exactly. Let's find it's you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Whatever, whatever you expect. What what we get in this world is not necessarily what we deserve in life. It's what we expected that we were going to get. Whether you expected it consciously or you expected it subconsciously, and that manifested in anxiety, you are creating the living circumstance that we have on a day to day basis. Now, what happens is you start looking at an atom. And the way Max Planck described it, Adam, before is we go before we go mm -hmm. further, I just want to keep people out of like a dangerous rabbit hole of that. That doesn't mean that the woman that gets raped called forth the rape no. from her from mm -hmm. her own. There are agents that can act and usurp another person's will and usurp another person's attraction and projection and actually force them to participate in their own attraction projection internal game. What you're talking about is the internal landscape. Yeah. And, How you and, perceive it. And often that correlates to something external because you'll find it, you'll search it, you'll look for it, you'll notice it, you'll follow that path, you'll draw it to you. But however, it is a principle that absolutely applies to your internal landscape. 90% yeah, of what happens to us is not actually what happens to us. It's what we believed happened to us. Right. And again, that's getting to that mental space of it's a mental universe. So what can I learn from this experience? Why am I projecting this experience? Or why am I seeing it through this prism? What is it that I can learn from this? So in that context, every person you meet, you can learn something from. Every circumstance that comes up, you could find a synchronicity in it or not. It's up to you. There's something that comes to mind when, when I'm talking about this, and it's, it is very much a hermetic principle of alchemy, mm -hmm. you know, this being able to turn lead into gold and this is a mechanism of perception not actually having anything to do with metals on the periodic table although many people have tried foolhardy in a foolhardy approach it's, to try it's and, symbolic it's symbolic and one of the great stories of this is uh the taoist i think she was taoist tantric teacher and, and kind of like the the i don't know in some ways the founder of this kind of school of thought yes she's so and uh jamie wheel talks about it in his book recapture the rapture she's traveling alone on one of those call it the king's road if you watch you know mm -hmm. watch game of thrones right on king's Love road dangerous <laughs> dangerous place mm -hmm. some brigands find her on king's road and they go to rape her and she was in such a state of consciousness that actually she saw not the rape that was occurring, but she saw the pain and the sorrow and the trauma and the sadness that was in each of these men. And she held in the frequency that, of yeah. seeing that. Mm -hmm. And the men actually carried through. They were in the heat of their passions and they're in, the, in, the, in their full you know, bloodlust and violence carried through with the quote rape which of course it was, and, and it was, mm -hmm. and this is the paradox, but she didn't see it as that. And because she didn't see it as that, when they finished and she just saw them as the humans, the flawed, broken humans in pain that were reaching out you know, to try to claim some power and she saw something different and they broke down in tears. This is the story. Mm -hmm. They broke down in tears and then they all devoted that we will protect you and fight for you for the rest of our life to make up for what we've done because you've showed us, you've showed us the truth of who we really are and beneath this and showed us something different in this world. And so that, and, and, it, and in the story, it's like she didn't, she didn't record, you know, the violence aspect of it. She recorded something different and they recorded something different and then it shifted the timeline radically for her, for her, for those men and then for the world from that act of alchemy. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should be able to do this, blah, blah, blah. This is not like a should game, but this is showing the alchemical principle, the possibility. And it's a divine aspect because I think another good example of what you're describing is, you know, how Christ took being crucified. Yeah. Right. The, the whole thing. It's what, stoic principle. It's the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's probably going into their consciousness in the same way that this woman did and seeing the broken and, and finding within his own suffering, right? He was still had total power over how he was going to perceive 
and how he was going to experience this horrific experience. And to me, that is a personification of the divine. Mm -hmm. And being able to see the world that way, I, I did a podcast recently in LA with uh, Amber Khan, who I love dearly. She's awesome. Uh, and she, she's a, you know, a follower of Islam. And she started asking me, she said, well, what about, because she knows I take more of a Buddhistic approach on duality, right? And she's like, yeah, but what about all these people that do these really heinous, horrible things, right? And how do you, how do you perceive that? And so I, I, I stood, you know, stood my ground. It was an interesting, it was an interesting conversation, but at the end of it, she started talking to someone else in the crowd who said, you know, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel good enough. And I feel like I've sinned so much in life. I've done so much stuff wrong. God could never possibly love me. And her response was, you know, in, in the Quran, it says that God loves you 40,000 times more then I love how they love to put a mathematical number to it. Yeah, yeah, For, yeah. Why 40,000? 40, <laughs> 40,000 times more than your mother. And he doesn't see you for the sin. He sees you for the person. It's like, you know, abhor the sin, but love the sinner. Mm -hmm. And she could look at it in that context. You can hate the war, but love the soldier. Exactly. She, she saw it in that context, looking at it in the eyes of God. And so then I, you know, said... What you just described explains how I feel about non-duality, which is, I, it's not that I condone the horrible, abhorrent act. I don't. I don't condone it. I, I don't want to see those things happen in the world. But at the same time, I realize that all of us are human beings. We all are imperfect. We all are making mistakes. And at the end of the day, everybody that claims to be only good is not only Bullshit. good, right? <laughs> the only people we should be probably concerned about are the people that claim to be only good because that is narcissism, right? It's the people that know that, as Alan Watts says, they're, they're, they're rascals at their core, yeah. right? It's like the people that don't know that they're a rascal at their core, those are the ones that still haven't yet discovered what the darkness is. What is dark matter? What mm -hmm. is dark energy? Maybe it's just the things that we don't want to allow to even be in our consciousness. Yeah, and, and, and that aspect of distortion that I was talking about, distortion is a force and you could personify that force and it's been called many names, the beast, the antichrist. Antichrist is an interesting word I've been playing with. I want to touch on one thing. So mm -hmm. if we say Melchizedek is in the frequency of Hermes, mm -hmm. in the frequency of mm -hmm. Hermetic teachings, one of the quotes that I pulled out of a recent book from Paul Selig is, how you change the world is by how you see the world. Right, so his, and this is exactly what Yeshi Tsogyal demonstrated, is by her act of seeing the world differently, the world actually changed. Her world changed, she recorded something different. Viktor Frankl did something different, something similar in Auschwitz. Like people making these incredibly wild and radical perspective change that seem um, impossibly divine, you know? And you do that and it actually changes the world. And this was mm -hmm. really kind of the guiding principle behind Arcadia, that festival we threw is like, let's, beautiful. let's see the more beautiful world and let's bring it into form now. By what an own. epic place that room was too. I it's know, like, it was unbelievable. That was so like, cool. Like, <laughs> it was unbelievable. Talk about feeling like you're in a 5D kind of a world. I mean, really well done on that. That was yeah. really cool. But you're right. I think it comes down to, you want to change your world, start by changing your perspective on the world. Yeah. Start to try to see a different way of seeing it than you've seen it before. Because seeing it the same way over and over again and you're not happy, <laughs> you know, some might call it delusional. I don't. I actually call it ascended. If you can start to see the world in the context that you would like to see the world, then the world will start to reflect more of that back to you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a mathematical equation. And another person that I think would be tied to Thoth and Hermes would be Metatron. So it's just the angelic form. And you've probably heard of the 72 names of God, right? So Metatron is known also in the non-canonized books of the, the Bible um, as being kind of like the highest of the archangels, right? And there's some connection as well. Sometimes people refer to Metatron as the lesser Yahweh, right? Yahweh being the name of God, right? And it's, it's kind of interesting because there seems to be this connection also between Metatron, angelic representation, Thoth, hermetic principles, geometry. Yeah. 
And one, if we're right here, we haven't gone too far past the second principle, the principle of correspondence. The one note that I have here from the Kabbalion is in studying the monad, which is the divine spark that we hold inside, yeah. mm-hmm. you understand the archangel as within, so without, so as, with, as above, so below. So actually, if we want to understand Metatron and if we want to understand all of these angelic beings, look inside yourself and you'll find it. Also, if you want to f- find and understand the demonic beings, look inside yourself. Look inside yourself <laughs> and be willing to confront it. And and this has been a big part of my Integrate. journey. Actually, it started in Arcadia. I did a ketamine cannabis journey to prepare myself for this big week ahead, and it was a very surprising journey because it showed me. And this is skipping ahead a little bit to the principle of polarity, which we'll get to. But it showed that I'm choosing to embody a particular type of polarity upon the spectrum, but I'm the entire pole. I'm the yeah. whole pole. And what it showed me was my the opposite polarity of what I'm choosing to express that right now. The vision that it gave me was a black hole with teeth. It was like full Shiva the Destroyer. I was just fucking, I was a, I was a monster. I was a monster. And I was like, holy shit, that's me too? A black hole with teeth? Like, it was like the, the fucking pit. You're like Luke Star- Skywalker going Star in the Wars. cave, dude. <laughs> it was intense, man. And, 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 that, and that journey has continued of showing me all of the darkness that you could possibly imagine in the world, but showing it as me. And in that journey, it's, it's deep and it's intense and it causes, a, it causes a flinch, you know, because it's one thing to look at the darkness and not flinch, see a shitty movie with some torture or something like that. And you want to kind of close your eyes and like turn your head and not look at it, of course. But then to see it as you, oh, that's a whole other fucking level. And in the ceremony space, you know, if you try to look away, if you try to run from these different aspects, it's like a bear that's just going to chase you and start eating you asshole first. Like it doesn't doesn't sound good. It doesn't care. (laughs) It doesn't care. You know, you can't run away from these different things, which is one of the reasons why I really have such deep reverence for the plant medicine path is that in the psychedelic it reveals path. things it reveals to things you. Mm-hmm. and Absolutely. you don't and you don't have a choice you do have a choice but the best choice is to surrender and see what it's actually trying to show you without trying to change it or without trying to flinch and actually in this process of seeing that opposite polarity the anti aubrey which is also the aubrey the christ and the antichrist are also like mm-hmm. transpose and we'll get totally. into that principle polarity by seeing the anti aubrey it actually made me in a way more aubrey because then I realized that I was choosing to be Aubrey. I wasn't just, I just didn't come out of the fucking womb. Boom, here I am, here I, I'm Aubrey. No, I'm a full spectrum being and I'm choosing this. And in choosing that, there was a strength. There was like, oh, I'm choosing this. And so I trusted myself. I trusted myself to be able to choose which polarity I wanted to express at just a little bit more from that journey. So just the deepest gratitude for actually embracing the entirety of my darkness so that I'm now reinforcing my choice to participate in the light. And of course, also, you know, I love talking shit. I love being a fucking rascal. I love all of these. You're definitely a rascal. Oh, of course, of course. (laughs) But I I think you see that and you you do see that in yourself, which which is what is so endearing, right? That, That to me is one of your greatest qualities is that, and it's, it's very Alan Watts in its feel, right? Which is Alan knows he's like, he'll call out rascal stuff. He's like, I'm the worst rascal of all. Like, are you kidding me? He loves to joke and he loves to like rib people. And, but that's just kind of who he is. And he, and he's, he's with that. He's good with that. And this is back to the individuation process Carl Jung is referencing. And that's what alchemy is all about. All Carl Jung did is he took alchemy and put it into words that would be fitting to the scientific community. Mm-hmm. What you're really talking about here is just shadow integration. And us understanding or not understanding dark matter, dark energy, to me, is just a larger metaphor for us starting to now understand our shadow collectively. It's all mind. Mm-hmm. When we look at it from that context, like everything shifts. Everything shifts. You look at Jesus. Okay, Jesus, what did he do? He just told everybody, you know, judge not, right? Lest you judge yourself, love God, with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's really all he taught. You got the Beatitudes, a few other things, you know, the meek shall inherit the word. But man, did he ever get attacked? Mm -hmm. He got attacked. So it's not about seeing things. I used to say that we see things from our own vantage point. 
Now I change that to say we see things from our own advantage point. Mm. This is our perspective. The thing that I think is going to benefit me is how I'm going to see whatever it is that I see. And until I can break away from that, I can never see the dark demon with the teeth that I am. Right. Right. And as soon as we start to see that, then the power that demon has over you diminishes dramatically. Mm -hmm. Because the more you try to repress it and say, no, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it will just come out and like you said, eat you asshole first. Yep. Every time. And you won't even know until it's already consumed a good portion of you. Yeah. And then you're like, how did this happen? I'm finding myself in the same situation again. I'm experiencing the same pattern over and over again. That's what hermeticism is really about. It's not about looking at the world and saying, here's what's fucked up about the world around me. It's about looking at yourself and going within and saying, uh, who am I? Who am I in my full spectrum? And then being able to be at one, at one meant with that or atone mm. to that way of thinking. Yeah. It's just, this is making me think of the, uh, and they have this, I think, in the, in the recent printing of the Kabbalah, and at least I don't know about the original, but they have a painting that by Michelangelo, which I think we talked about on our last podcast, which is, and you mentioned how God is showing up in a human brain and you did a lot of cool geometry mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. with that. But I don't know if we necessarily touched on or if, or if I just didn't recall it, but how that was actually showing that the universe is mental, that actually God was inside a brain yeah. in the Sistine Chapel and then reaching towards Adam. And if you look at Adam, he's kind of like, lazily putting his finger mm -hmm. up and kind of turning away like it's kind of bent like, like this. basically it's, like yeah. i know god i know but i'm gonna look away just enough that i can go play this game over here and live this experience of separation so that i can have maximum complexity creation all of the different things i don't want to look straight at you face to face to god and see all of the truth revealed because then I'm not actually in polarity. I'm not actually having this experience. So man just kind of turns away and lazily says, yes, God, I see you. Uh -huh. You're right there. All is mind. But I'm going to play this game for real, just like I play one-on-one -on -one basketball, like you know, I'm going and, and playing to the death. Yeah, you like know? shuffleboard, you crush me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. 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 Like it requires if if we just looked at if we just stared at each other when we were playing shuffleboard right mm -hmm. before this, and I just looked at you and say, I see you, Robert, as yeah. God, as me. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Like, no, I'm gonna we, win, motherfucker. Why, why right. are we <laughs> Why are we even rolling these pucks in the first place? Of course, no, we just skipped, I'm going to win, motherfucker. That's, right, the, exactly. that's what made it fun. That's and right. that's why Adam is like, yeah, I see you, God. But, and I think it's important to do both. It's important to be like, yes, God, yes, God, I know. And me as Adam, I want to play like this. You know, yeah, I want to totally. experience it like this. No, this is, this is what we're here for, to have this experience. There's another part of that painting, right, on the Sistine Chapel. And... So it's so beautiful. You look up and you see this entire massive thing. And of course, you know, their bodies are almost like hyperbolistically, like the, like over everything. Right? Mm -hmm. Everything is like their proportions are bizarrely off, but still beautiful. Yeah. And one of the things that you notice about it, because we never talk about like a heavenly mother. And yet, if you look closely at the Sistine Chapel, you, that particular image, you will find Sophia under the arm of God the Father inside the brain. Now, she's not going the same direction. If you look at it closely, the way Adam's body and his leg is curved, right, and laying there, and he's got his hand up like this, and God has actually got his finger straight out, yeah. right? It's very deliberate. Adam is, like you said, kind of like looking away and not really p fully paying attention. Maybe there's something there. Maybe I'm not fully aware of it. But the way his leg is curved is matching the way that God's body and leg is curved also as a mirror reflection. You'll see that. But you'll also see Sophia, this younger woman. He's got this white hair and everything. And Sophia is like this beautiful woman. He's got his arm around her. And the way she's positioned is in the form of an X. So she's positioned crossed where God is positioned. So it forms this X. And what that X actually represents is the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm meets, it's where... Your right eye meets up with your left brain, and your left eye meets up with your right brain. And it happens right at the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the feminine 
aspect inside of what's called the Cave of Brahman, cave or the wedding hall, as it's often referred to. We, we talk about this, you know, wedding halls and Last Supper and all this stuff that we see in the Bible. All of these analogies and metaphors are relating back to some physiology even in our brain that's part of ancient Kabbalah, that's part of Gnosticism, that's part also of this Hermeticism. And what this is basically pointing to is that you've got a masculine principle, you've got a feminine principle, the pituitary gland is right at the optic chiasm. And then you've got the, the pineal gland, which is like shaped like a human anatomy, like a human anatomy, but the masculine form of it. The pituitary is actually shaped like the feminine form of anatomy. And there is a breathing exercise that you can actually do to raise those to the same plane. It's part and parcel. You probably heard about this cecum, or it's also referred to as the Christos, mm -hmm. coming up the spine to light up the chakras. When you do this process, it's an all an alchemical process. What you then will start to realize is that you create a marriage between this masculine feminine aspects in the brain. And this is the birth of the spiritual aspect of the self. That's why it's also called the womb, not only the cave of Brahman, but it's shaped just like a womb. If you look at a like a, a view of it as a photograph, the thalamus is shaped just like the womb is shaped. It's mm -hmm. identical. And inside that, there's a little walnut shaped thing that's right at the top, coming right up the shashumna, right? So you've got the Ida Pingala, the masculine form, the feminine form, these two snakes creating the staff of Hermes. And right at the top of that is this thalamus. And this thalamus becomes a new entry doorway for the initiate to then be able to experience Shambhala. Mm. And it's a, it's a very, it's, you'll find this across many, many different esoteric teachings. That this is a process that becomes a true second birth or a spiritual birth following your resurrection. And it's all following Joseph Campbell's hero's journey as well. Mm -hmm. That each of us have a hero's journey in this matrix of mind. And that's why I do believe that it's all literally planned out because of cause and effect. We are experiencing a retro causality in time on both directions. The future determines the past as much as the past determines the future. We've all seen this, right? We all experience things that are bad or horrific sometimes. And we can't have the opportunity to see the wider perspective that maybe this is a good thing that's happening. We think it's a bad thing. But with the perspective of time, sometimes the polarity of that experience shifts to the positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is bringing up something for me that I wanted to talk about. We're jumping ahead to principle six again, the principle of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So in, if I read this correctly, the Kabbalion is basically saying that the all, which is what they call it, many names for that source, God, mm -hmm. whatever you want. Um, the all is the causeless cause basically, right? And in some way- It's like the formless form. The formless form, mm -hmm. the causeless mm -hmm. cause. And that's the only thing that's outside of this law of cause and effect, that mm -hmm. each new cause has a form or effect. To me, my understanding of free will actually dovetails with this in that we participate in the all and there's the intent, which was also, you could say, God's, what I've always understood from all the medicine journeys long before I had any text that made sense was that God said one thing and that was yes. That was the choice, it was yes. And there was a choice and that was the intent. And then everything else flowed based upon all of the little pieces of God making additional yes choices making mm -hmm. additional intentions and it seems to me that we have free will to the extent that we can access the i am that participates in the field of the all mm -hmm. and so that we can actually generate a causeless cause if if we're able to tap into that aspect of us that participates in the original causeless cause but otherwise we're just yeah. going to be that log they talk about this in Kabbalah the log in the river that is bouncing between one bank and the other and getting stuck on rocks but we can actually start to swim a little bit we won't be able to escape cause and effect but we could just swim a little mm -hmm. bit to maybe mm -hmm. avoid this eddy maybe move toward this thing maybe find a, play, a way that we can get to take a rest on the river bank for a little while yeah. you know and that's I think a, a deeper understanding at least for me that works about what free will really is. Yeah, I, I look at it in a very different way than I did only a few years ago. And I, I'm just on the path learning. So I'm not saying this is more my opinion than anything else, but I feel as though what we refer to as free will or what we refer to rather as destiny, 
let's start from the destiny standpoint. Maybe is just the free will of the higher self. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we're, and we're, we're saying applying, very something similar. We're yeah. applying the context of a linear perspective of time when all dimensions of time exist simultaneously. There's just a study and a, a new scientific theory that just came out, I think it was out of MIT like about two weeks ago, that basically said, okay, we, we now believe that all dimensions of time exist simultaneously. And it's kind of funny because academia is now becoming the last to know everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, and then they claim, they claim their ownership of the idea, even yeah. though this has been around for thousands of years, right? That a, a lot of the context that we have in a scientific sense is just sort of the confirmation at the end where the reductionist says, yes, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's one of the things that unfortunately is still kind of upside down in society to a certain extent. We don't recognize that science and spirituality are not juxtaposed. Uh, and I delineate between religion and spirituality. To me, religion has the tendency to be more about teaching and purveying judgment and especially organized religion. Sure. And whereas spirituality is kind of the opposite of that. It's about looking within without judging the outside and learning to no longer judge yourself internally. And through that process, you can now take on empathy for everybody else. And that actually starts to ease your suffering. Yeah, and look, if you wanna see the correlation between r spirituality and science, the basic fundamental, if you actually get down to the core, pure essence of what each is, it's just asking questions. Yeah, it's curiosity. It's just curiosity. Totally. It's just fucking asking questions and never now, claiming. Now we're not never allowed claiming to, even to have ask an questions. But because science is becoming more like religion, and yes. religion, you were never yes. allowed to ask questions. Well, well, why do the people who never heard of Jesus go to hell? That doesn't seem fair. I asked that question when I got honey dicked into some fucking Bible study on a ski trip that I thought was just a ski trip when I first moved to Texas. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. There was people for thousands and thousands of years that never heard of Jesus. You're saying they're all in hell. 80,000 years of humans all in hell because this person hadn't been born yet and they hadn't heard about it? What about that person in a fucking village that never heard anything? You're like, well, that's why we send missionaries. Like, this is not a God then if they're putting people in hell for something they had no agency over. This is a demon. This is a demon. And they're like, okay, maybe you should just go ski. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate that. That's all I wanted to do anyways. You're like, it's one o'clock, man. <laughs> it's, that's all I you wanted know, to do anyways is fucking ski. You guys <laughs> sort out your not asking question ass and like, let me go ski. But that's the idea. And, and we entered a period of science where people were doing the same thing. Like you weren't allowed to explore, discuss, no, talk about all No, questions are concepts. the things that are like most provocative, right? And problematic. People asking questions. Look what happened during COVID. Yeah. People simply asking questions, getting censored like crazy. You're not allowed to think that. That's even in Canada, they actually refer to it as sort of like, what was the term that, that Justin Trudeau used? Something like unlawful thoughts or yeah. you know, inappropriate thinking. It's like, wait, what? It's kind of like beyond the bizarre. But this is going to the principle of rhythm. Mm. Right. And I, I, I refer to this as rhythmic balanced interchange. Now, Walter Russell doesn't talk about, he was a polymath in the 20th century, often referred to as Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century. And Walter talks about rhythmic balanced interchange all the time. I'm going to put it in, in more concretized terms. So a lot of people don't know this. When you think about the party that is, is very much oriented around, you know, NAACP, is gonna be the Democratic Party. But a lot of people don't realize that that was the party of slavery. It was Lincoln, right? And the Republicans who basically said, no, 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 this is wrong, right? The, the North was very much about, you know, this sort of Republican thinking, Democrat thinking was in the South, but the parties were exactly juxtaposed to where they are. How can something like this even happen? Now, first of all, you go to polarity and the principle of polarity. Mm. Is it a coincidence that elections swing on 1% and that's really not based on there being more Democrats or Republicans in the two-party system? It swings based on who's more angry than the other. Mm. That's really what's happening. Who's going to actually have voter turnout more than the other because they're more angry? And so we go through this cyclicality. But when you look at it from a macro perspective, even the principles upon which parties stand, their general foundation and basis can flip 180 degrees in 170 years. Yeah. It happens all the time. 
And this is the nature of rhythmicity. And it's and it feels like it's actually flipping again. Yes. Which is an interesting which is an interesting thing, right? Like the and of course words carry a lot of weight, but if you think of kind of ideas that surrounded totalitarianism and fascism and control, top down control, I mean, those were always associated with the right. And it started to flip in an interesting way where that's now becoming associated. Yeah. Antifa is supposed the, to be anti-fascist, but why does it act and feel like fascist? Right. It's it's this very interesting, and we're in this interesting liminal space, a time between times, a time between stories, as Rabbi Gaffney says, like a time between stories. And in this time between stories, polarities are up in the air and different things are all, all in flux. And... It's the most interesting time. Well, think about it. It's like we look at North Korea. Is North Korea a social communist regime, as they claim to be, a social democratic party? Have you ever noticed that that's the way it's positioned? Even Hitler ran on a social democratic platform, but he very quickly becomes a fascist. Every single time throughout history, we'll see this rhythmicity. We'll see this cycle. Mm -hmm. Whoever it is, whether it's Castro, right? Chavez, whoever it is that becomes authoritarian and fascist. And the way you know it's fascist is when you look up and you see on the walls, giant photographs of the father figure, mm -hmm. right? Whatever, when you go to a country that's got like this gigantic picture, like you go to Tiananmen Square in Beijing and you see at the Forbidden City, this gigantic photograph of Mao Zedong, then you know you're in a fascist regime. Mm -hmm. This is not communist, you know, everyone's equal, united order kind of concept. No, it's like everyone's equal, but some are more equal than others and in absolute control and it's authoritarian. And so what's happened is you notice that it's not linear. You know, when someone is to the far left, they'd make one step and they're actually popping out they on the, the other loop. side they make the loop. because it's a circle or mm -hmm. it's a sphere. Yeah. We think of the pole as a line, like a pole, but it's not, it's a hoop. It's a hula hoop. And this is what my own journeys through the darkness showed. It was, they were harrowing journeys that I've been on where I'm going in to see the dark and darkness in all levels from even the disgust impulse was an interesting portal that I went into the, the, all of the things I was disgusted at, because if you're disgusted by something, whether it's feces or whether it's bugs or whatever it is, then that thing is something you judge, you know? And so until you get beyond that, you're going to be still lost in judgment. You're not going to have any hope for right. unconditionality. Mm -hmm. So it was showing me. And as I walked through this, it was like, you know, there's a quote from Nietzsche, like, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, beware, be wary of staring in the abyss, lest the abyss stares back at you. But then what they, for, what they missed was like, okay, then what happens? Like when the abyss is staring back at you, then what happens? Well, keep walking and keep walking and, and hold the faith that you're going to make, make the loop, make the loop of the pole and find your way around the other side. And that's one cycle of the hero's journey. One cycle of the hero's journey through the darkness back into the light, bringing back to home, new wisdom, new insight, new discoveries that you found. Guess what? Back again, back into the darkness, up into the light. This is the process of evolution. Yeah. This is the principle of rhythm just shown in a circular pattern rather than in a sine wave form. Yeah, it, it, and that is circular in a way. It's yeah. just looking at a two-dimensional view of that circularity. Right. Right. And that's, you know, that's another thing that Matthias says is what we're trying to do now is, is the fact that we're in another cycle where things are being torn down and this is, we're in this cycle. It's like a, the down, call it up, down, whatever. This is a very mammalian perspective, but up, down, down being the, down being the bad when likely that could be easily reversed. Could be good. <laughs> you know, but, but ultimately like down being the down cycle, the goal is to just minimize the extremities of the, of the cycle of of the principle of rhythm so that the work that we're doing is to try and keep us from crashing so deep and so far down that we suffer more than is necessary. So it's like just kind of holding things in love together and making the transformation so that we can find bottom faster and then level out the swing and then be wary lest we get to the top too fast and there needs to be a de steeper crash. It's just trying to kind of level things out a little more balanced because the extremes are just gnarly in our density of polarity. They're, they just are. They may be fine from a cosmic perspective, but they hurt. People starving hurts. You know, people suffering hurts. People dying hurts. It hurts. 
So like trying to minimize that as much as we can, that's the bodhisattva compassion. That's like, no, let's just hold each other. Even though we can't stop the cycle, let's hold each other. And that's what they talk about in the principle of rhythm. It's like, can you polarize yourself in a different position that you're not actually stopping the principle of rhythm because you can't stop the principle of rhythm, but you can polarize yourself in a way that the principle of rhythm doesn't affect you. You can raise your vibration. You can raise your vibration, and which goes exactly to the above principle. And that's exactly what you principle. described with the woman who got raped on the side of the road. Mm -mm. Yes, she'd so go. She, she raised her vibration, was able to go through this very traumatic, difficult experience and change the lives of all of those people in the process. That's uh, also Yeshua. It's the same, same concept. You know, principle of polarity and rhythmicity tied in together. So here's how we can apply this to something that's what we live. Does the earth spin clockwise or does it spin counterclockwise? I don't know. <laughs> I should know that. It spins counterclockwise, okay. right? So that's what people would say. Of course it but does. But the, so the real answer, you. the real answer is it depends. I thought my whole life it spun counterclockwise. And then I realized that, no, that really just depends what your reference point is. Because if you're North looking at the earth from pole. the North Pole, yeah. then it spins counterclockwise. But when you're looking at the earth from the South Pole, and who determined what's upside down in space? Right? There's yeah. no upside down in space. I mean, it's not like we're imagining people that are upside down in Australia or semi upside down or in Antarctica. If you look at the reference point and change the perception and really change the polarity of your perception, because perception is polarized. Mm. And that is your collective conditioning biases and all the things that go into how you determine who you decided to be and how you will see the world, both maybe in this life and maybe several past lives as well. You're carrying this accumulated baggage of perception so that we look at it and say, well, maybe this is really just a point of advantage because the people that were setting up school curriculums and in, in universities and in you know the Nobel Prizes and everything, they all say it's counterclockwise because they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm. It's a point of advantage. So yeah, and it's, it's a like, different way of sun, looking at it. For us, we think, oh, the sun's up. Sun's up. Well, not at night. Sun's down. <laughs> sun's, right. sun's underneath our feet on a different part of the world where for them, it's up. That's you right. Know, but for us, it's down. That's why when you flush the toilet in Australia, just like on The Simpsons, it actually does spin the opposite direction, just yeah. like cyclones spin the opposite direction from a hurricane in the Northern Hemisphere. It all depends on your point of reference. And we can take something and say, this is scientific fact. It's scientific fact. It spins counterclockwise. No, it's, it really depends. Let's change our polarity. And is it negative versus positive? I don't really think so. You know, people all say, well, wait a minute. You're saying that women are negative because it's a negative pole? Isn't that, isn't that oh, a negative we gotta, term? We got to get to that. I got a lot to talk about. That's the seventh principle, the principle of gender. But I'm not finished with the principle of vibration here. Let's stick with number three. And uh, the principle of gender is really interesting. It's the seventh principle. So principle of vibration, number three. This was one of the quotes from the Kabbalion. The atom of matter, the unit of force, the mind of man, and the being of the archangel are but one degree in one scale and all fundamentally the same, the difference being between solely a matter of degree and rate of vibration. So basically, referring again to the principle of mentalism, all is mind, all is mind that is, that is articulating and manifesting in just different degrees of vibration. You know, and that's the principle of vibration. Now, vibration could probably be exchanged with other words that are synonyms for vibration, right? But nonetheless, frequency is another way to say vibration. But that's basically what it's saying. It's like, it's all the same thing. It's just at a different rate of speed, the different, at a different either. Yeah. And, and also the most incredibly rapid speed appears very solid. Like the atoms moving in this table that feels very wood-like is just moving so fucking fast, solid. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's yeah, very I, I interesting. Look at, I look at matter as light that is suspended between the centripetal force of gravity and the centrifugal force of radiation. And it's basically light. So the, the, that's, that's the way to think about it, that it's suspended light. Now we have this, you know, probably luminiferous ether is what people refer to it as. And I'm a believer that, you know, it was a real travesty when Einstein kind of said, there's no ether. And I think he wanted to revise some of that thinking towards later in his life when he couldn't figure out an answer to gravity still, right? Even though he, he purported to sort of, sort of support uh, called the Kaluza-Klein theory. But 
But the point is that each of us can be deliberate about our own vibrational experience. What holds us to the lower dimension of vibrational experience, and what is vibration? It's cycles per second. That's a way to think about it. So cycles per second. So if I do a vibration and I do a beat, it would just be boop, 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 boop. It might be, you could count how many of those sounds I could make per second. Maybe it was like one and a half, or maybe it was less, I don't know. But if I take it up to like 432 cycles per second, it's gonna play an A note mm. in the fifth octave of sound. So as you take it up further, let's take it all the way up from where we're looking at sound by another 55 octaves to get it up to the Terra frame. Now you're in light. So sound and light, even though the scientists on the call would say, well, wait a minute, on this podcast would say, wait, you're talking about, you can't mix longitudinal waves with transverse waves. Well, yes, actually you can. They're, they're related. You have an, uh, an artifact of sound, which is phonon, and you have an artifact of light, which is photon. Phonons carry mass. Photons are massless. The two are related. One is just traveling at different speeds. The speed of sound, depending on what medium is going through the, through the air, it goes 343 meters per second. When you look at it in terms of that would be about 730 miles per, per, uh, per sorry, 730 miles per hour mm -hmm. is the speed of sound. So when you have a jet that's like traveling, you'll hear that boom sound right behind it. They used to have that. It happened a lot more when there was Concorde jets, but now they kind of retired. Well, I just things. saw the latest Top Gun movie, which is kind of interesting, right? It's uh -huh. like got it to Mach 10. It's like 10 times the speed of sound, <laughs> uh, which was like so incredulous, but also kind of fun to watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, we have light speed, we have sound. The two are actually connected. One is just a transverse representation of the other. One is the reflection of the other's absorption. The two are connected, absolutely connected. So when we think about our own vibration, does this mean then that if we could raise our own vibration, we all have these feelings of like, okay, I can get into different brainwave states. So you've got kind of like delta brain waves, you've got theta brain waves, which is you know what we're doing with sleep and, and sort of subconscious responses, autonomic bodily responses, et cetera. And then you go beyond that to alpha state, which is what happens when you go into meditation. Alpha state is between eight and 12 hertz, right? So cycles per second. So I close my eyes and if I get to above eight and earth is at 7.83, it's called the Schumann resonance, okay? If I get myself to get in that place and the fastest way to get there is to either Get on your knees and pray, or to just close your eyes in meditation. And as you close your eyes, you're still conscious, you're awake, but you close your eyes, you can get your brain to the coherence of this higher state of vibration. That's when you start getting a whole new experience of life. And that's why meditation becomes so critically important. And this has been around for thousands of years. They weren't counting the cycles per second. But that's actually what it's doing. And another interesting thing that I think about with these brainwave states is actually, so there's certain psychedelics that can get you to waking delta. So delta is between one and four mm -hmm. hertz. It's the right. slowest brainwave mm -hmm. state. And when you're in waking delta through a ketamine experience or through a nice experience, it's very much a unicity experience. But you also get a very similar experience when if you're talking to Joe Dispenza's top meditators who's hooked up to the EKG machines yeah. and mm -hmm. and they're looking at it. It's EEG actually, right, for the brain? Electroencephalograph, yeah. right. Um, so they hooked them, hook them up to the EEG and they're actually in high gamma of several thousand yeah. hertz, mm -hmm. which is very much mimicking what you're experiencing in the low delta range, right? Yep. And so the low and the high are it's actually the giving you a, a very similar experience. Yeah. And then somewhere in between you find your spot you know obviously in beta we're handling beta shit where we and are stressed now. out we're talking and, and, and yeah. you know it's kind of good maybe for... you bro i'm fucking straight out for the whole way yeah yeah there you go <laughs> let's there get back go. to the shuffleboard that's right. table that's why i like there was those muse headbands where you yeah. could like gamify and compete with people about how deep you could get into alpha state or even if you could touch oh, i'm state. building right now a spiritual game Mm -hmm. like a, a spiritual game, which is called Cyberverse. It's going to be like really cool. And in this game, you can pick your avatar. You come to earth. You could pick all of your, you know, your, your Zodiac, your numerology. You could pick all of your different aspects of your avatar that you want. And that will then 
dictate a lot of the types of experiences that come your way. Sound familiar? <laughs> right? It's literally recreating. It's, it's like training wheels for you to look at the world in a virtual reality or an augmented reality world. It's a different way for you to look at our own experience now. Yeah. And then how each of those experiences that come at you, and it's all built, built on the, the base principles are the seven hermetic principles as well. And I thought there's no game like this. So we learn through games. We learn through experiences. It's more than just didactic, right? So I thought this could be kind of cool. You know, people like this type of stuff. Who knows? So we're building this. And the, the thing is, is that I believe that you can raise your vibration. You can get to these higher gamma states. You can get beyond beta, right? Beta is between 12 and say 30 hertz in that range. But then when you get up to kind of the 100 hertz range, then you're looking at gamma brainwave states. And that's where you get this bliss mm -hmm. kind of feeling as well. It's like this total bliss feeling. You're then going into another dimensional frame. And very likely, as you go higher and higher, because the way the, the comment you just read there is that, you know, the angelic being, right, is really the same thing, just in a different vibrational state from what you and I are. Mm -hmm. That to me gives me hope because yeah. it basically says, okay, then I can raise my frequency no matter what happens to me. I, I saw something recently that's like, I, I love the post that you did. It's like, if you want to see joy, then be the joy, mm -hmm. right? If you want to see love, then be the love, right? Mm -hmm. Be the change you want to see in the world. I love that. And to me, enlightenment is when you can cross the street and someone can hurl all kinds of terrible insults at you and you're unfazed. You're completely unfazed. You're not anxious about the future. You're not, you're not anxious about the past. You are in this place of Zen, which is like, nothing is going to phase me. I'm determining my experience with my surroundings, not the other way around. And that requires, first of all, the conscious decision that you know that your vibration impacts the experience in the world around you. And you can raise that no matter what that experience and world around you is. And if you don't, then you'll just continue to feed into that same loop cycle. And then, you know, the hammer and the nail analogy comes back again. It's like, oh, there I am again. I'm getting victimized again. Damn it. They always hate me. You know, why is I'm always treated unfairly? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, you know, can't do, can't do, can't do. The only real obstacles we face in this world are the ones we truly believe in. Yeah. If whatever you believe, you're most likely right. <laughs> you know, like if you think you can, or you think you can't, you'll be right. Yeah. That's, that's the Henry Ford famous quote, right? If you think you can, or you think you can't, you'll be right. And it goes back to the whole story of Star Wars, which is another hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Luke Skywalker had to find his own darkness. He had to go and battle Darth Vader, who later he finds out is his father. And he had to crack his mask and then see that it was his face inside the helmet. Mm. We all have to go through that moment. We all have it. And that's the shadow integration part that precedes being able to raise to higher states of conscious and awareness. If you can integrate your shadow, that's what hermeticism absolutely teaches above all else. Integrate your shadow, understand who you are, understand these principles are all like principles that must carry through. They're like the base fabric of this existence or what you know I would refer to as like a construct. And as I've been making this game and designing this game architecture with my teams, I'm like, whoa, this is like kind of trippy because I don't know that I would make much of a different world than the one we live in. Yeah, it's, that's the whole Alan Watts thing about dreaming. You know, you dream something farther and farther, far out until actually you forget that it's a game and there's actual chance and that there's things that appear to you, not by cause and effect, but appear, appear to you as chaos because you can't even recognize the law because you don't have the purview to see the law. So it feels very real to you. You've got blood in the game. And I think that's one of the things I realized too is we wanna have blood in the game. It's the argument that Sebastian Junger bases the book Tribe upon, the thesis that we want blood in the game. We actually do want blood in the game. And so it also helps you understand, you know, I got, a, I got some friends who are preppers, you know, who are like, building their own bunker and their own thing. And you know, I got a farm and stuff and I, you know, I'm down, whatever. Like, I have this friend also, uh, Billy Carson, who literally built an entire city of underground, three, three, underground like 500 <laughs> feet underground yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately like I get it, but there's also what, another thing that you have to get is some, the, the part that it's a little disturbing to me and has kept me away from it is, you know, that some part of them wants some shit to go down. 
But then, so so then I would find myself judging that, like, oh man, like you want something to go down. Why else would you be doing all of this stuff? Some part of you secretly didn't actually want it. You know, they never admit it because it's horrible. It's a be horrible experience, totally. right? And but there's some part that wants it. But then I just realized, well, they're wanting something to go down. It's probably just because they want to feel like they got skin in the game. Life is too easy. Everything is too comfortable. Everything is too in its same routine and its same pattern and it's boring and they don't feel alive. You know, like <laughs> I just was rewatching Game of Thrones and uh, my my buddy Ed Skrine, mm -hmm. he shows up in season three as Dario Naharis. Fucking such a great character. I hated it so much when they changed him. Dario, is that the guy that died in the, the Khalees, battle? Khaleesi's, Khaleesi's boyfriend. Oh, oh, yeah, that guy. Khaleesi's, yeah, yeah, Khaleesi's yeah, boyfriend badass. with the long- He never with, speaks, right? He's just grunts, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> said, well, well, Ed's character spoke, but he goes, he says, uh, he says, I'm a very simple man. I'm a very simple man, Khaleesi. Uh, I live for fucking a beautiful woman who wants to be fucked and killing a man who wants to kill me. And like, that was the simple, that was his like simple life philosophy. I thought right? you were going to say killing a man who wants to die. <laughs> no, <laughs> nope. That was not, that wasn't going to cut it for him. Doesn't want to be an executioner. <laughs> but, but this idea of what he's talking about is he's, he lives for radical aliveness, eros or dark eros as, as Rabbi Gaffney would call it, which is the eros of experiencing the erotic through the entanglement of a goddess who wants to make love to you, right? Like he was contrasting it with his other leaders of the second sons who just paid for whores back in there in this in this world that we're creating. He's like, not for me. I wouldn't do that because mm -hmm. I want I want to fuck a woman who wants to be fucked by me. You know, like that was that was that's error. There's a there's a certain like attractiveness in that. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> to say the very least, right? So, so like that or the dark arrows of, oh, you want to kill me? Excellent. I have a sword and let's go. Because both, if you do both of those moments right, you are so radically in the moment. I mean, I've never been in an actual sword fight. I do kendo matches, which is like a approximation. Oh, yeah. But the worst consequence is that mm -hmm. I do, do them like without the armor. So we get, we have just a helmet. So we get slapped helmet and gloves. So it hurts, but whatever, it doesn't really matter ultimately, but nonetheless, it gets your blood up and there's nothing else that you're thinking about, but your bamboo shinai and the other person's bamboo shinai and the combat that you're in. And I can it, only imagine. It, it, it hurts when you get hit with it. Of course. And you I get hard with it. Yeah. I could only imagine how much more into it and how much more alive you would be if those swords were metal and their swords were real, like we can't even fathom that. I mean, I think the closest approximation would be MMA or something like that. But, and, and, and I haven't also stepped into that world in a serious enough way beyond training. Are you making an announcement now under, that no. we're going to do it? <laughs> no, no. I actually thought I was at some Live point. Live kendo then, with swords. Yeah. In an, in, <laughs> they do have those. In, they do in, have those, in a decagon. Okay. <laughs> they do have those leagues. They're all in Russia. That's they have right. like, like medieval knights that fight each other. But nonetheless, the, the point being is that like we want to feel alive. Like we want to feel alive. Basically what he's saying is I want to feel the most alive. And these are the two portals. These are the two doorways that make me the most alive. Well, and it's a very honest, it's a very honest way of him saying, you want to understand me? I'm quite simple. I want to be the most alive. And the ways I get most alive is by fucking a woman who wants to fuck me or killing a man who wants to kill me. So take that exact same thinking and apply it to mentalism. Yeah. So we're building a game. Would I want the game to be absolutely real? Like, I would think it's so damn real. And after I like got to a stage, I'd be like, I want to go back. I can do that again. I'll do better next time. <laughs> right? It's like, it was so real. I, I just got this pair of Oculus Rift goggles, right? Mm -hmm. And I met with uh, dinner with uh, this Palmer Lucky, the fantastic interesting guy right? he's the founder of oculus and he got fired from facebook and he's he's like a ball of flames guy like i'm really very interested in how he, he thinks and i put on my oculus rift goggles or whatever and they took me to uh the guy do you ever set that 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 tv show that was the one where he climbed el capitan with no alex oh yeah, or something yeah, yeah. Like that? with no ropes with no ropes like wow wow it's like most people spend days trying to climb this thing. And he's like, nah, if I can't do it in like four hours, then, you know, yeah. with no ropes, I'm just going to like go do that thing. And I think to myself, I, that's not a sport that I would probably choose, even though I've done rock climbing before. And it's, it's scary as hell. 
Right. It's literally scary as hell, especially when you're up there and I was climbing in Idlewild and there's like helicopters. It's like, what the helicopters there for? Oh, somebody fell. Mm. You know, it's like, okay, but the shit feels really real. You're, and it's that radical you're aliveness. Like, you're sleeping on the edge of a knife. It's that radical aliveness. And for me, I didn't choose that. But if I had chosen to be you know, a climber of Mount Everest, and as you're climbing up and you're seeing all the frozen dead bodies along the way, there is something about this that is like, it's that radical aliveness. And we get kind of very attached to that radical aliveness. But if you were designing a game construct, right? let's say you're putting yourself in the shoes of the higher self. And... The lower self would say, well, this is, is this like destiny or my free will? And you were designing this game as your higher self. And you would say, okay, Aubrey is going to have a certain experience. And he's, you know, I've chosen for him. He's going to be, you know, uh, Aries or he's going to be whatever zodiac sign you are, right? And he's going to think that it's all chance. But actually, because astrology, alchemy, all these things, esoteric wisdom, they're all tied together the weights and measures, all of this. Because also Thoth, Metatron, these same figures throughout history are ones who actually gave us weights and measures. We think that it's all arbitrary. They're actually all mathematical constants, mm -hmm. all of them. Do you know that six feet, which is a fathom, which is really just father, mother, fathom, mother backwards, six feet minus one meter is the Euler number. Euler number hmm. is the second most important mathematical constant that there is. Right. Right. And it's the, you know, it's probably equally important to pi. But we think that these are all just arbitrary units of measure. You know, isn't the foot just some king's foot? No. In a mental construct, in a game of mentalism, all of these things are deliberate. So maybe by the choice of your zodiac in this game construct, Maya. It determines how successful and abundant life you'll have. You thought that this was all just your own work. Things maybe just came easier for you in some ways. And other things were harder for you because this was the path you chose along your hero's journey. And it's beautiful when you start to look at it from that perspective. You start to become one with this higher mind and realize that there is a purpose to my life. It's not just to be here and die. I'm here to learn something. I'm here to learn love. I'm here to learn acceptance. I'm not here to learn judgment. I'm here to learn and transcend judgment and experience love. Yeah. And does that resonate? Of course. And, you know, as you're talking, I was, it, it brings me back to this idea that, you know, when we had this idea that a foot was actually the king's foot, and it would constantly change. And this idea that, oh, how fucking annoying. It's a foot. This is a, used to be a foot, and now it's not a foot. We have to change our measurement, put out all whole new rulers, and redo the whole structure of everything. How crazy that would be, because it's the denial of law. It's saying, like, there is no law. Everything is subjective. However big this king's foot is, that's how big the foot is for now. Whatever this word means now is what... There was no law. There was no absolute truth, first principle, first value. This is, I think, the flaw of postmodernity is, yes, question everything and recognize that everything is a story. However, we still have to hold true to the laws like these, like these principles. And it doesn't mean that we can't maneuver within the laws. I mean, one of the guiding points of the Kabbalion is use law against law. The master knows how to use the, the principle of vibration to escape the principle of cause and effect to a certain degree. Like you can play within the rules. That's what a master actually does. But you acknowledge and respect the laws. It's the creative constraint to life itself. And that's fucking beautiful too. And I think we can go far too, I think postmodernity has gone way too far in saying nothing is real, everything is subjective. And no, wrong. Yes, lots, lot is subjective, but there are, there is law. One of my favorite lines from the Declaration of Independence is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are basically endowed with certain inalienable rights, that among these, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to ensure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers, interesting, the use of the word just powers, from the consent of the governed. There's always a balancing act. Even the founding fathers, when mm -hmm. they're looking at this, and by the way, all the founding fathers, 
all her medicines. If you look at the list of people that were the signers of the Declaration of Independence, they were all hermeticists, almost to a person. They all believed in these same principles, whether it was Benjamin Franklin or George Washington who said, I, I don't want to be a king, even though they want to make me king. He wanted to step out of that role. He's like, okay, I'll subject to being president, but because out of duty. And then he's like, I want out of this thing as soon mm -hmm. as possible. And he, he lived to his word on that. And he died not long after, you know, he spent only a few more years after he was no longer president that he, that he passed away. But the, the point being that what we look at in the world, we have to be able to take a step back and say, okay, this is the laws of the land. And then also here's the laws in the context of the universe in this hermetic principle, whether you ascribe to this or not. I think everybody can probably look at some of the seven hermetic principles and say, okay, there's probably some wisdom in there, even without accepting the first one, which is the most important, and that is that it's a mental construct, that it is a maya. And it's not only hermeticism that says this. Maybe hermeticism is what permeated into the concepts of Hinduism, right? That permeated into Taoism and Buddhism. Who knows? Maybe it's that same reincarnation or right. that same matching of frequency over and over again. But if we can be able to step back from that and realize that everybody that ever did anything horrible through society, for the most part, if you interviewed them, genocide, right? People that were despotic autocrats that killed people that were against them, they would probably say they believe they were doing it for a greater good. Mm. Like and Thanos. Thanos. It's their point of advantage. It's not their vantage point. It's their point of advantage. And what... Hermeticism is about is being able to see that in yourself and say, whoa, it's not the world around me that needs to change. It's me mm. that needs to change. Yeah. And here, and it gives you some keys that you can start to use to try to start and that's to alchemize. The keys throughout history, keys of Metatron, keys yep. of Melchizedek, keys of, of Thoth, right? Keys of Peter, keys of, of, uh, of St. Germain. There are all these different keys, and that term key keeps coming back over and over again, and you'll read it a lot as well in the Emerald Tablets. So we're talking right now about alchemy, and these are some of the keys that are beyond the laws, and we got to get back to principle of gender. We will. Uh, it's, that's the seventh principle. I'm just going to read a couple things here from, from alchemy. Use law against laws, the higher against the lower, and by the art of alchemy, transmute that which is undesirable into that which is worthy. And they give two examples. To change your mood or mental state, change your vibration. One may change his mental vibrations by an effort of will in the direction of deliberately fixing the attention upon a more desirable state. To destroy an undesirable rate of mental vibration, put into operation the principle of polarity and concentrate upon the opposite pole to that which you desire to suppress. Kill the undesirable by changing its polarity. And so some of the examples that come to mind is, all right, you're afraid. If you try to go kill your fear, that's not using this hermetic principle. You don't go try to kill your fear. You apply the opposite pole, which is bravery. Or love. Or, or love. bravery, courage, yep. uh, or gratitude. Mm -hmm. So you apply a different thing, and then that's actually what counteracts. That's alchemy. That's or, alchemy. Or focusing your attention on that's a different thing. That's led to gold. That's led to gold. And this is also where I think I find some, <clears throat> recently had a discussion with someone. He's very focused on the darkness of the world. He's into this kind of, you know, the, every, there's this giant, you know, conspiracy uh, of sorts that's trying to derail us and fuck us up and lizard people, the whole thing. We've heard it before, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all, all of its different variations, some more plausible than the others. And some part of me is like, yeah, dude, maybe, maybe. However, the more that you try to focus on that thing and kill it, it's not going to fucking work. Like, it's going to get worse. You might be right. You might be like, you might be smoking bath salts. Like, I'm not sure. But there's some good reason to think that maybe you have some of the things you're saying are correct. But the pragmatism of what you're doing is where I draw some question like, yeah, okay, it's good to be in awareness of it, but to continue to focus on that mm -hmm. thing and try to destroy that thing rather than try to apply the opposite polarity to that thing, which is like, we have this principle of the antichrist. What about the anti-Satan or the anti-distortion? 
well, then you get to the Christ anyways, right? So you're you're actually applying the opposite. You wanna you wanna fight the darkness? Well, fucking be the light. You know, right. apply the light. Mm-hmm. Like that's don't fight darkness with darkness. And there are certain instances where fighting fire with fire actually makes sense. Sometimes you do need to actually contain something. They do this in forest services, a controlled burn to stop a bigger burn. I get it. I get it. There's times in which things are needed. Sometimes actually eliminating someone or putting someone in prison. I understand all that. I'm not saying like this is some Pollyannish world where you can just apply this. Again, we're talking to mental principles. Sometimes in the 3D, actions need to be taken. You know, fully understand that. But overall, from a meta concept, you know, looking at the whole thing, these principles are actually going to get us where we want to go. You are so right on this. Um, the best example I can think of this is when I was leaving Bausch and Lomb. I had left Allergan, which is a giant company, and I was I had a very successful career selling Botox and Juvederm and Lapan and Latisse and launched all those products. And I took a job. I got recruited by one of the largest private equity funds in the world. And I was at that stage in my life where I was like, okay, I was living out my persona, right? Here I was, 40 year old, like, you know, being a like a badass ballin'. dude, balling, right? I'm balling. I'm running a multi-billion dollar organization. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is badass. You know, I, I'd come to my national sales meetings. They'd be playing like Tony Stark music and I'm coming down on this platform <laughs> type thing. They got a video of me. Like they've got my face superimposed on like Tom Cruise, like, you know, in El Capitan or something like doing this, you know, Iron Man type of a climb. And I'm like, yeah, this is my life. I'm like living it. And I get recruited by Bausch and Lomb and and by uh, Warburg Pincus, one of the largest private equity groups in the world. It's like the one that's like a badass group, you know, like they're kind of KKR plus, even more boutique-y, but the same size. And there were seven offices. people who knew what you just said, but yeah, don't worry that's about right. That. So for it's you like, seven who understood who KKR was, good, good yeah, for you. Yeah, KKR is a mad, large private mad, equity mad group. Props. Yeah, yeah. So the point being that I'm living this, and then all of a sudden my hopes were dashed. Because I was going to take this company public and spin it out, take it public and be, you know, live my dreams of, okay, I'm going to create this thing. And now I'm really personified, right? This is what I want to achieve. And I was 41. And all of a sudden they changed their mind. Like, no, now your business is doing really well. We're not going to spin it out. We're not going to take it public. We're going to sell the whole thing to the arch enemy of arch enemies, which was this company called Valiant. And it was not Valiant, which would be V-A-L-I-A-N-T. It was with an E, like L-E-A-N-T. It's like, oh, wait a minute, does that mean it's really Valiant or sort of like askew? And the company ended up going through a lot of stuff and they really were not customer oriented. It was just a total anathema to what I wanted to be mm-hmm. working with. So I decided to, to leave, right? And you know, here I was, I basically got fired from this company. And even though I'd been very, very successful with it. So I fly on the way home. I'm on this plane and I like throw up in the bathroom. I'm like, terrible. Life is like broken for me. And I'm like, what the heck did I leave the job that I had for? Because I'd only been there for like not even two years yet. And the next morning I woke up, I was feeling this depression sort of set in. And I walk outside of my house in Laguna Beach and go to pick up the paper because we still had newspapers back then. It wasn't that long ago. And I go to pick up the paper and I remember reaching down, I'm in my robe, because it's probably already like 10 o'clock in the morning, but I'm kind of in this depression. And something triggered in me, and I thought to myself, today will either be the best day of my life or the worst. The choice is mine. High stakes bet. And how do I then transpose this thing that was terrible that happened? I'd made a bet and I lost the bet, right? And I thought, I'm successful in this. I'll be able to do the things based on the success that I had. No, it was the exact opposite. And so I had to think about this differently. And I said, how could I recreate this circumstance to make it the very best thing that ever happened to me? And that was the moment I decided to start my own company. And it turned out to be one of those seminal moments where I was like, because of this, I am free now to go and build whatever I want to build. And it became that like, absolutely crux moment, which was like, now I can go do and and do all the things I really want to do without having to compromise, without having to, like, I really want to be able to experience this. And that was actually what set me on, in a way, a spiritual path. Because up until that time, I couldn't really speak about 
my own spirituality or what I was experiencing. I was already going through it at that time, but I couldn't speak about it. Now I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to compromise what I believe would be the ideal situation. I want to create that situation. I had other bumps and difficulties and crises along the way, but it was one of the best things I ever did. So everything that happens to us, we can flip the polarity of it. Yeah, or and change your mental state by by an effort of will, by an effort of, you made, through effort of will, decided to make that day a different day than what the what the path was laid before you were said no. And this is something that I've been following all the way back to one of the first teachings I came across when I was in high school was Carlos Castaneda's work. And they talked about intent. Don Juan was always talking about the power of intent. This was the power of the Nagual, the one who paints mm -hmm. their own masterpiece of life. Nagual meaning artist. Mm -hmm. Tonal being basically the canvas upon which life mm -hmm. paints you. Mm -hmm. And the defining characteristic of the Nagua, of the, the, the one who can paint their own masterpiece, was that they were able to apply intent. And really, that's again another hermetic principle of saying, by this force of will, by will, you can change, and by what you focus on, and by all and, of this. And flipping the polarity of your perception. Yep. You can, you can shift things and you have agency, more agency. And you would, they called those people wizards because of what they were able to manifest within themselves and also in the world. That's, that's magic. And know? that's actually what you're bordering into now are the next stages. You know, if you go back and look at what was the first historical reference to astrology, <laughs> it was the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it was almost identical to the Western astrology we have today. So who started this? Because it does seem like remarkably accurate on so many levels, right? Numerology can be like crazy accurate. And so when you start digging into it, you're like, who established all this stuff? You know, the 52 card playing deck even, right? Where did all this stuff come from? You're gonna find that literally all of it, this esoteric wisdom that seems to have withstood the passage of time, all came through Hermes Trace Majestus. <laughs> We've left one principle out. I'm gonna cover it because this is, uh, this is an interesting one. It's the principle of gender. And they write, gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Everything, let me say that again. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. Now, of course, we've reduced gender to a discussion about biological man versus biological woman. But that's actually, and I think this is something that actually current post-modernity culture has got right, is like, yeah, it is kind of silly, actually, to determine your gender by your genitals. That's another thing. That's a biological thing that we can, is important. And that's one of those laws like, you know, no, the, the, this is still important. We can't erase the fact that this is biologically a man or biologically a woman. There is no pregnant man. Some have tried. However, <laughs> however many emojis you want to put on my fucking phone, there's not going to be a pregnant man. It's just not going to happen. I saw a picture of one recently. <laughs> that's a, not that there's anything wrong with that. I was just... Just it just it's yeah it's 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 the law it's the law it's the Tao it's mm -hmm. old you know there's there's certain things that are the law that we can't that we can't change but nonetheless to understand that there's a spark of truth in that being that yeah gender is in everything and within us is all an infinitely complex unique multiplicity of genders a unique gender and so it is reductionist to say, oh, you're a man because of this you know, genital package that you have and this testosterone ratio or whatever the fuck biological measure, which is all true. But there's also something to say, ah, well, let's look beyond that and let's look a little deeper and understand the deeper principles of gender, which apply all the way through the universe and try to get out of our mammalian biological frame of man versus woman you know, and get into another frame where we see these as archetypal energies of the universe that we all participate in to different degrees. So I see this also as another form of metaphor. So we talked about the optic chiasm, right? It's shaped like an X. So that's why it's called a chiasm. Chi is the Greek letter X. And if you look at the left brain, which then connects to the right eye, and the right brain, which is the creative seat, connects to the left eye. So we talk about in Egyptology, we talk about the eye of Horus, right? This is the myth of Osiris. 
and and actually Osiris is relative to Orion, the constellation Orion. That's why the belt of like the, the Orion is the exact match to where the pyramids were or are where they're placed. Not only there, but also in Teotihuacan, Mexico, in China as well, where there are pyramids and several locations around the planet. This Orion representation of Osiris is telling a story. Now, the story of Osiris is Osiris was this Greek, oh, not sorry, he's actually represented across many, many different pantheons. So we start with Sumerian. Sumerian had seven gods in their pantheon. And then you've got the Greek gods that come out of that as well. They're all the same. They're just different names. Same thing with the nine gods of the Egyptian pantheon. And then you go to the Norse gods, and they're also the same. They're just under different names. So you've got Wotan, Odin, right? All of the Thor, right? Thor's day. Thor is relative to Jupiter. That's why it's Judy for French, which is Thursday. They're all relative. They're all the same. And you could go across cultures, and it's since the beginning of our recorded history like this. It's fascinating. And I've studied this stuff. You could spend a lifetime just studying the etymology of these things, literally. But the point I'm trying to make is that when you look at this context reference point of all of these things through history, it's basically giving us a story of Osiris, Osiris going through periods of reincarnation. Maybe Osiris is also relative to Thoth. Who knows? The story includes Thoth. And the way the story goes is this. Osiris has a brother. His brother is Set. Satan. Set. Hmm. It's the same kind of concept as, again, etymologically, it's a match. So Set is this guy with this hooked nose. He's not very popular. He's kind of like dark. He's always represented as very dark in his complexion, even though probably Osiris was also dark as well, but he's always represented as green or blue. They just chose a different identification point in their polarity. They just chose a different identification point. Maybe they were point. the same being of different, <laughs> of, of opposite polarities. So here's how the story goes. People don't ever talk about it, but Osiris slept with Seth's wife. Rude. She was hot. Rude. She was hot. It's very rude. That's not cool, right? And that's his brother. So he slept with his brother's wife. Okay. Not a cool thing to do back then. Not cool today. What was his wife's name? Neftis. Neftis. Neftis was super hot. And Neftis was in the Greek pantheon was actually Athena. Right? So she's got she's got some moxie. So Inanna was the god of Sumeria who was both Aphrodite and Athena wrapped into one. Mm -hmm. Okay? So she was the goddess of love, sexual love and war. And romanticism, all these things wrapped into one. That broke in the Egyptian pantheon from because they only had seven gods in the Sumerian pantheon. Then it went to the Egyptian pantheon where there's nine. And, and then that breaks into Isis, which is analogous to Aphrodite, and Nephthys, which is analogous to Athena, mm -hmm. right? And so, again, a goddess of war and sexual love, but also represented as a virgin, interestingly, right? So... He not sleeps a, with Neftis. Not Neftis. after Osiris. So that's right. <laughs> Osiris, he, he handles that. And Set finds out, gets really upset. And Isis is sort of like, you know, boys will be boys type of thing. She's Isis pissed off. Is, is the wife is, of Osiris. Yes, yeah. the wife of Osiris. And this is Aphrodite. She's like, look, I'm the most beautiful woman in the world. And you're like going off with Neftis. So he sleeps with Neftis. And afterwards, Set and, and Osiris are at this party, like a banquet festival or something. And, and Set wants to give a gift to his brother. So he makes this coffin for him, right? And this coffin is like this big wooden box type of thing. And he says, the person who can lay in this coffin and fit in this coffin, you know, deserves the, the kingdom type of thing. So he has Osiris lay in the coffin. And as soon as he does, it's kind of like a slapstick comedy, closes the lid on him, nails it shut, throws him in the river, <laughs> right? He then gets the box, takes him out to make sure he's dead. He cuts him into 14 parts. Cuts him into 14 parts. Now, it's interesting that the Vitruvian man on da Vinci's you know, very famous, iconic illustration of the man within the circle and the square, the circle representing the feminine, the square representing the masculine, cut him into 14 parts also. It's a representation of Osiris. This is Egyptian mythology now. So what does he do? He cuts him into 14 parts, and the one part that gets lost, and he goes to all different parts of the Nile and across the valley and everything, the one part that's gone is his penis. So Isis recruits the help of Neftis, the woman who slept with her husband. He's like, you know what this thing looks like. Help me find it, baby girl. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> to find the penis, right? To find the penis. And, and they don't find it. It's missing. So then the, the rumor is it must have been lost to the fishes. And some people think that Neftis stole it and she kept it. 
Right. She kept it. But Isis said, no matter. Nothing like that God dildo when you, when That's you right. really Isis need it. Isis said, no matter, I'm going to make a new one made of quartz crystal. Right. And this is going to be like the magic form of it. And so when she does this, they end up, he's resurrected from the dead. They have sex and they end up having this child called Horus. Horus wants to avenge his father years later, picks a fight with Set. And what does Set do? Set gouges out his left eye. This is why it's called the left eye of Horus. Now, who was it that brings back and fixes using magic this left eye? Thoth. Thoth brings, so sometimes referred to as the left eye of Thoth as mm. well. And what it's actually doing is it's connecting the left eye to the right brain. The right brain is the seat of creativity, intuition. So now we've got a linear side of our brain, which is our left brain, which is mathematics, it's rational thought, it's the no, not the yes. And then you've got the creative side of your brain, which is the right side of your brain, assuming you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's the opposite. And you've got the left eye that connects to the right brain, which becomes the eye of intuition. So the return of the left eye of Horus means that you're bringing into balance this masculine and feminine principle, one being the feminine, so the, the right brain being the omega. The chi, the optic chiasmus, right? The optic chiasm is the X that connects the eyes to those different sides of the brain. And you've got linear on the left side, you've got uh, curvilinear on the right side, and irrationality, right, on the right side, the feminine principle. So now we bring our brain into balance, alpha, chi, omega. It's in balance. So this is the balancing act that's going on. So I, I look at this from the standpoint of gender. I don't see one as positive and one as negative. That's just a, a convenience for us. Well, that's it's just and I think it's actually a trap. Forces. It's a semantic trap, yes, actually. It is. Because negative is means many other different things that are quite frankly, negative in the sense of that word. Yes. And so the association of negative with feminine, masculine with positive is something that the Kabbalion actually started me on a path to understand. It gave me a key to understand like, all right, so what does this really mean? And so they go into this feminine being the womb of creation, the place that actually sources energy, the, the source point of energy, the positive being that thing that carries energy for the evolutionary purpose of transferring data and information and energy, basically inseminating ideas, moving it from one place to another through that linear phallic line of let me go now impregnate this, whether it's DNA or whether it's a concept or an idea, but it all comes from the womb, from the source point of creation. And this is the principles at the higher level. And so we look at a battery and there's the negative part of it. And then there's a positive part of it. And what they're pointing to in the Kabbalion is like, all right, well, if we apply the principle of gender and stop just saying negative and positive, then there's the feminine part of the battery. And then there's the masculine part of the battery. Like which point is the one with the little nub that's pointing out, well, of course, that's the masculine part of the battery. That would make sense. And where is the energy actually stored in the battery? Well, it's in the negative pole or the feminine pole. So that's where the feminine energy is actually from. And then that brought me down this whole line of thinking of like, you know, they talk a lot about how the health properties of negative ions mm -hmm. and negative ions are found, and I actually wrote this down, negative ions are abundant in nature, especially around waterfalls, on the ocean surf, at the beach and widespread in mountains and forests. They neutralize free radicals. So that's the point. That's And you go into these natural places and you're like, ah, the negative ions. I was like, no, that's not negative ions. That's no. feminine energy. Yeah. You're in it's Gaia. Semantics. You're in the great mother and you're receiving negative ions, but it's feminine energy. It's at the beach. It's why Aphrodite comes out of the sea foam. It's why Venus was painted that way from Botticelli, right? It's like understanding that in that different way and then saying, all right, well, what are positive ions? And I'd look that up. In nature, positive ions are commonly formed by strong winds, dust, humidity, and pollution. They are at their highest levels before an electrical storm. In general, anything that's toxic or has electromagnetic capabilities will generate positive, uh, generate harmful positive ions. So in this, uh, in this point, we're like, oh yeah, positive ions. Well, that's but they also- they need to be neutralized. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's masculine energy. And mas masculine energy can have a toxic effect when of it's course. not being directed towards the right it purpose. It needs the feminine. And also like it, right before an electrical storm, like forget all the pollution, right? But right before an electrical storm, there's 
the possibility of that lightning bolt coming and carrying information. And actually, when I got this this download, I talked to Matthias about it. I was like, when lightning strikes the earth, is it carrying information from one place to another and transferring it to the mycelial network? Because I actually heard Paul Stamets talk about this, that when lightning strikes, the mycelial network of the earth actually responds in a different way. Yeah, and I mean, so like it's the rece- tree network on the planet is, is no different than synapses. Right. And it's like receiving new information, but also like the positive is transferring that information from one place, from the ether, from the clouds, from the air, down to the earth, the mycelial network, that womb of Gaia, all spread throughout the surface is receiving that energy. And so now I look at the whole world in a whole different way. Right. And I've started thinking about like, Man, it's not just time in nature. They call it nature bathing or forest bathing. It's great, but it's actually bathing in the mother. It's bathing in feminine energy. And that's healing and nurturing and restorative. Of course it is. Of course it is. So is going, if you have a sweet mom, like going and spending time with your mom and like giving her a long, big hug. That's going to be restorative too. You're so right. And what's also interesting is you look at the seven hermetic principles. They're actually matching our chakras. So we, we think about the first of mentalism, and how does that relate to the root chakra? Well, because we're born into this world and we're given a construct that's all about materialism. And we have to learn to transcend that and realize it, that there's a higher mind aspect to this. Mm-hmm. But the construct has to be that it's throwing projection at us all the time about the harsh reality, the suffering, the difficulty of being here. Adam will live by the sweat of his brow once he's ejected from the Garden of Eden. And and each one of these different principles are different aspects of our own chakra system as it comes up. And the highest relates to the crown chakra is about understanding this principle of gender. Now, have you wondered why it's funny, I saw this uh, excerpt from uh, Bill Maher. Do you watch Bill Maher at all? I mean, uh, it's been a while since he, I've seen he's him. He's got sometimes he's like totally whacked out. Sometimes he says, says some really funny stuff, right? And the the presentation he gave is he's like, okay, here's the deal, guys. And he kind of he tries to be more libertarian, I think, at times, but sometimes he veers more into the left side of things. And I'm very much right in the center, so I, mm-hmm. I just kind of look at it. I don't assign it to either party, but it, he basically gave this presentation. We had a PowerPoint, and he said, look. Here's what they're saying, you know, that here's how much the population has increased in its sort of tendency towards homosexuality, right? And non-gender, non-binary kind of associations and all this pronoun usage, you know, you go on social media, she, he, she, you know, him, whatever, right? All they, these different yeah, things, they, um, and, or X, now it's X, which I find also an interesting synchronicity of reflection because here we are with quantum computing where we're going from a binary code of ones and zeros now to advancing from one zero to X, a superposition. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not know this, but the other reference to Hermes is the divine hermaphrodite. Mm, The rebus. That's right. It doesn't mean that Hermes is, you know, of one sex or the other per se, or that you have to be like in between and become this non-gender, you know, non-binary type of person, although some may choose that. What it means is that he's in perfect balance, mm-hmm. right? In perfect balance. And that perfect balance manifests itself because what it really is a reference to, I believe, is to the way we perceive information, take information in and how we process it, and then what we do as a result of that. It's left brain, right brain. The right brain is the feminine aspect of the brain. It's the creativity. It's the intuition, right? It's the nonlinear. It's the, wait, this doesn't make sense. It's like the emotional side, being able to tap into that emotion. It is when we can embrace our subconscious mind, we can then move beyond in this individuation process from the conscious mind construct, which is very limited, to being able to tap into our own subconscious mind as well. And when the conscious becomes conscious of the subconscious and that being itself as well, then the superconscious mind emerges. And that's what the X, the Chi represents, superconsciousness. That's why you'll see imagery I believe, throughout society today, all about the X. You're going to see X stuff everywhere. We're seeing it as well. 
And it's funny, Bill Maher's representation is, geez, if this trend continues, like, you know, 100% of the population by the year 2030 will all be either gay or transgender, <laughs> right? And he's like, that can't be right. So something's either wrong with this, with this graph. But I think what it's actually showing, again, is this representation. We never had when we were growing up. I never, it was not this whole thing where transgender was this really, really huge thing. Now it's becoming this very, very huge thing. And to me, I look at it more as, again, in a mental construct of the universe, another reflection back of what is changing in the world. And you're going to see all aspects of that. It's not necessarily that it's all going to be perceived by us as this positive thing, right? There's always going to be polarity with everything that we see. Yeah. And our perception will always be polarized until we can step out of that and say, okay, hold on a second. I'm falling in the same traps that I had before. Let me try to look at this differently and go to the opposite pole of judgment towards acceptance and love. Yeah. You know, it seems like in this gender change phenomenon, ultimately we're all, we all have the ability to express as any variety of different genders. That's within our capability. That is the principle of polarity that we're the whole pole from masculine to feminine. Now, the body is only is binary it's either has you either mm -hmm. got well i guess sometimes you could get a some kind of you know hermaphrodite actual literal hermaphrodite type of situation where there is you know actually literal blended gender in the body in in some way and i think people are creating that in a way but the the challenge is is that if you keep trying to chase the body to match you know to match like what's in your mind your mind might be a moving target that's going all, I feel like this gender now, and I feel like this gender now. Like when I was a little boy, I would sign, I would play with one hour with my little ponies, and my older stepbrothers would look at me and be like, "Man, I don't know about him. I don't know about that Aubrey." <laughs> you know. And then the next hour, I'd be playing with my He-Man, right? Like, yeah. And one point, I got my little brush out, and I'm like combing little my little pony hair. And another point, I'm, you know clashing different figurines together and holding my sword and pretending to be, you know, master of the universe or, you know, whatever He-Man claimed himself to be. But nonetheless, like, this is something that's going to be playing throughout our life. And I think, I think where, and I think it's beautiful that we can actually, if we decide that we want to polarize at one point and be Caitlin instead of Bruce, great, fucking go for it. Like, go for it. Where it gets challenging is if, your brain is still forming and you're all over the oh, place yeah. in the polarity, yeah. you know, then making a switch that is not, you're not able to switch because it's not the mind. You're actually surgically doing things or chemically doing things with the body. That's where it becomes a problem. And you may be right. You may be, maybe you got it right, but it's like, all right, yeah, just, just like chill for a little bit and make sure. And if you're sure, oh. you know, my, one of my great, great friends is Dr. Curtis Crane and he is one of the best sex change doctors in the whole world. He shows me, how he actually grows a penis on the forearm by this, like yeah. bending. It's unbelievable what he creates. Like he's a, he is like the fucking Botticelli of gender, of gender change operations. It's unbelievable what he's doing. And also the stories about the, you know, people who are suicidal, the lives that he's changed. He's really like deeply invested in, in this. And it's, it's fucking beautiful to see that. And, and I just think it's an include and transcend and being that that's great but also just be aware that we're all the genders yeah. all the time. I mean, we don't, we can tap into, I, I'm still a man, right? I'm very much like of, aligned with that, but I am now tapped more than I was before into the feminine aspect. What totally. does that mean? I'm more in touch with my emotion than I was before. Okay, I'm more in touch with my intuition than I was before. I can still balance that with all the logos. And it's when the pathos and the logos combine, then you have heart, brain, consciousness. That is what the true reference to me about understanding this principle of gender to move into the superconscious mind. The superconscious mind can tap into both sides equally, right? But the physical representation you come into, it's more a state of thinking than mm -hmm. it requires. It doesn't need to be a state of physical being, although some may choose that, and I don't judge that. Great. I think it's yeah. totally fine. Great. You know, I grew up, my I didn't know my brother was gay until I was 27 because he was freaked out to tell me, which was one of the things that broke my heart because I was like, why would you not even tell me? Yeah. And I had to like call one day. 
I was living in Australia. I was in the States attending the American College of Cardiology in, in Orlando, Florida. And I thought, I'll call my brother up just before I fly back to Australia, just say hello. So I called him up, and his I knew he had a roommate, and he was just out of college a few years. And his roommate answers the phone, and I said, can I talk to Michael? And he goes, he goes, yeah. Within half a second, my brother's like, hello? And I'm like, hey, do you guys have a room with like a small little table in between your beds or something like that. It was like that. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even know what to think. I was like, wait a minute. That's like, whoa. So I called him up. I said, you know, are you, are you gay? <laughs> he's like, he's like, yes. And I said, I love you. Mm. And he was so relieved. He was so relieved. But I don't believe that it, I agree with you on this, especially. I live in California. I have a son who's three years old. My son, you know, he's got a sister. He's going to have another sister soon. And the thing is, is that I, I don't want the schools to be imposing right. on him by basically saying at five years old or six years old, hey, uh, what do you more identify with? Yeah. I, I, and, and because literally because it's a day-by-day day thing. Made. Yeah. Because it's a day-by-day day thing. And it's not that – and it's funny because he's very different than my daughter. You know, I have three kids right now. I have an older daughter that's much older, and then I have – two little ones, six and three, and then a new one coming. He already is just this boisterous thing, right? And to me, that's not ta toxic masculinity. I, I don't even like the term, right? Because I think it's assigned to so many things. Men don't even know what to be anymore. And to me, that's a really, really sad situation for society. They just feel like they've been the shit kicked out of them right? So many times. Guess what, guys? You can be in touch with your feminine side. You could still be a man. You can be- It makes in, you more of a man. It makes you more of a man. It Honestly. Makes you, otherwise, otherwise, you're just constantly afraid of some aspect of yourself, which is real. If you're afraid of the feminine side of yourself, you're, it's such folly and it's, it lacks so much courage to like really embrace that element of yourself. That's what actually a true- strong, solid man is able to do, embrace their darkness, embrace their femininity, and not only embrace it, but, well, in the darkness you embrace it, but you don't act on it, obviously, because mm -hmm. the darkness is dark. But on the, on the feminine side, like bring that forward, like be nurturing and loving and listening and caring and all of these things we may associate with the opposite gender, but really it's not, or be the, be the womb that other people totally. can impregnate ideas too, which is listening. Be yeah. open to change your mind. Yeah. You know, all of these different aspects of allow me, let me, let me be impregnated by your ideas. Beautiful. I love that. You know, like allowing yourself to do that. That's, I think, the redefinition of masculinity that I think is happening. And again, we're in the time between stories where there was some elements of masculinity, which is way out of control. Elements of the patriarchy and elements of different things that had long standing roots. And yes, it needed to be dismantled, but it also needs to be replaced, included, transcended, replaced with something that's actually better, you well, know, a better, a better, truer system. And you look at the last 2000 years, right? We've been in the age of Pisces. Now we've moved into Aquarius. But Pisces, the opposite sign, the shadow of Pisces is Virgo, six months apart from each other. So that means that a lot of the archetypes that we're going to see through society during the last 2,000 years are going to be venerating virginity. That's what Virgo means. So why do you think we worship the Virgin Mary, right? You think about and chastity, and, such chastity a and all these things, right? There's a repression in society and the two fish swimming opposite directions that are tied together with a rope. That's what Pisces is. And, and actually, if you look back through history, you know, you got Moses who comes down from the mountain and says, hey, what are you doing with the golden calf? Well, that's because they weren't in the age of Taurus anymore, right? They were now in the age of Aries. So now everything, all the symbology was the blood of a lamb. Put lamb's blood on your door, right? The lamb is going to come. Well, lions and lambs will lay together. This is a reference to the Messiah, the Messiah. But then by the time Jesus came, it was already Pisces. I shall make you fishermen of men. You see these macro patterns throughout history, and the shadow context is this chaste, virtuous, right, um, judgmental aspect across society. Both masculine and feminine are looking at society saying, okay, well, it's better to be a virgin. It's better to be a chaste, celibate monk, right? And what we don't see, or better to be a priest, 
the priest is, you know, you go back to Colossians or Corinthians where you've got, you know, the the epistle of Paul is like, you know, if you're going to go be a missionary, go be a missionary. But but people often misreference that because they think of it as, okay, you're going to be a missionary. You should be chaste and celibate. No, he's just saying it's easier yeah, to be a missionary. That hasn't worked out so well. That hasn't worked out so well because every time we repress some aspect of ourselves, we create darkness. We create ignorance of that thing. We believe we're only good, then we do things that are so horrifically bad to society. The moment that we can start to embrace and integrate those opposite aspects of ourselves, bring them out of the darkness. This is why the things that people are studying in society right now, dark matter, dark energy. I've got uh, my own podcast, and I'm going to have Lawrence Krauss on that, who you know, his work led to two Nobel Prizes on dark matter and dark energy. I see the understanding that we have of these aspects of darkness, the things we don't understand, as part and parcel of the rise of the feminine. Because what's happening is that we're now starting to acknowledge intuition, magic. We're starting to acknowledge these aspects of society that we always looked at women and say, okay, she's tapped in. We've all said this. Like, I don't know, there's something, she's got some extra sensory capability because women are closer to that because it's part of the right brain context. And if you're a guy listening to this, guess what? The rise of the feminine is you too. Yes. You know, it, yes, it is. Yes, it is the goddesses and the priestesses and your, and your women and your daughters and your mothers. And yes, it's all of that, but it's also you. It's the rise of the feminine is within all of us. So it's a yes and. It's like it needs to be universal. Universally, we need to embrace these feminine levels of consciousness because we've been out of balance. You know, the the scales have not been balanced for too many years. And there's been a lot of structures in place to make sure that the scales never got balanced. Yeah. And now we're balancing the scales and it's messy. And it's a it's a messy, confusing, organic. challenging time. It's like life itself. You know, it's like birth itself. It's fucking messy. There's blood and placenta. And and if you see it from that perspective, you can stop getting so riled up and find like the beauty in all of these impulses, even like the pronoun impulses. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. Like recognize how diverse and unique you are. And and I've, I've, I've said this before, but my encouragement is just take that all the way that, that you're actually infinitely complex in your gender infinitely complex in your expression of good or bad or honest or dishonest there's if you go back it's like the fractal geometry if you go back and look even more fine even more fine you'll see even more complexity to the answer to that question and so no amount of labels are ever going to do it justice however if you like this label fucking go for it like go for it and if you have felt a certain way for a certain amount of time that your body is expressing the wrong thing for your psyche, great, change it. You know, just embrace also the full spectrum of who you are and just also have a little bit of humility for the complexity and confusion of the time that we're in. And you see that and and everything starts to look, wow, it's all beautiful. It's just a little messy. It's all beautiful. It's just a little messy. Let me just say one, one last thing, I think. And it relates to the feminine the women. It's also time for the feminine to embody that rise, right? It's, it's being acknowledged. It's real. But it's also important that you, you let go, that the feminine also let go of some of the hangups that the feminine might have accumulated along the way, right? These, these feelings of shame and guilt, particularly when it comes to things like sexuality, for example, that virginal construct is no longer the shadow of our society. Now the shadow in the background, what is it? Aquarius is Leo. The shadow is Leo. So we're going to start seeing more symbology in this mental construct of lions. We're going to start seeing more gold. Gold's going to become more popular than silver was, right? We see trend lines, little, little trend lines. Again, it's all about this rhythmicity. And with that gold represents this crown chakra awakening that means that we understand the role of gender and how it plays. One is not negative and the other is positive. That's just a convenience that we have used etymologically that we've used in order to explain something we don't really have a different way of explaining other than it's just an opposite condition. Mm. That's all that it is. And when the feminine fully embodies that, then humanity will embrace the notion that when the heart thinks 
and the mind feels, then the river of wisdom flows. Hmm. To me, that's where society is now going to next, that we can get there. And, and it's going to require just m the most significant change is a change in perception, how we see ourselves. So we can address things like consciousness. And then as we address consciousness and get to higher awareness states and raise our vibration, then systems will start to morph and change in, in ways that are more reflective of that consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is very much everything that I'm feeling right now. Same with my partner, Vailana, um, who you know as well. You know, she's releasing her album titled Goddess Rise about the rise of the feminine. Like mm -hmm. that's what she's working on. Our next Fit for Service Summit in Sedona is bringing light to the shadow, you know, going in and, and becoming aware of the full spectrum polarity of who we are. And so these are the, these are the things that I think I innately feel, and I think so many people feel, are the necessary remediation to where we've been, applying the opposite principle. Okay, we've gone a little too far on the masculine gendered polarity. Let's ap apply the other principle alchemically and the feminine principle, and then allow ourselves to correct and find that chi point, find the balance point between both. And I think that's what you and I and so many other people are here to do is to is to really help just do our best to lend our support, energy, love, heart, intuition, intelligence, everything we got, hands when necessary, to bringing about this new shift of consciousness. Well, I think we had a great discussion about hermeticism. <laughs> we did. We could talk about a billion other things, but we got into it, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's no simple no simple concept. So I'll go through the seven principles, and we'll let you guys. I don't know, decide to explore or say uh, enough of this shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. First principle, the principle of mentalism. Second, the principle of correspondence. Third, the principle of vibration. Fourth, the principle of polarity. Fifth, the principle of rhythm. Sixth, the principle of cause and effect. And seventh, the principle of gender. And allow these, as you go deeper, just allow these to be little keys. See what they unlock in your life. Thank you very much. Good to be here again with Absolutely, you. Absolutely, brother. This All is right, going to become a habit. I know. I have a feeling. <laughs> I do have a feeling. I want to get you on mine as well. Yeah, I'd love so, that. So uh, I definitely, I, I love the way you see the world, and I see how curious you are, that you have this curiosity that you want to really truly understand um, why things are the way they are and, and delve into the deeper questions. And I think that's the most powerful aspect of, of what you're doing because it's causing other people to look at the world in that light. And when they all do, then we all start to understand ourselves better. And I think that's the whole reason why we're here, to find out and remember who we actually are. Mm. And and get lo get a little lost along the way. Like that's Alan right. Watt says. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank we love you. you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for tuning into this show, everybody. Hopefully these laws and principles unlock some different keys and codes for you in your life. I look forward to having more conversations with Robert Grant out in the future. Thank you so much for your support. We love you and we'll see you next week.